Okay, welcome everybody. Tonight is the 23rd of March. We're at Dallas Personal Robotics Group Builders Night Virtual. We have a good representation from around the country, around the world, basically, and here to talk about robots. We'll just go around the table and maybe have a few uh, demos and uh, some thoughts and questions, and um, we'll just take it from there. And with that, uh, well, my name is Carl McCurran, president, so just trying to moderate things a little bit. And uh, let's start off with uh, with Chris from Connecticut. All right, thanks, Carl. So let me just put up a picture here and talk to that uh, entire screen. This one. Okay. So a couple things on that one. Um, all right, you can see my Romy platform, right? Yep. Okay. So last time, one thing just to, to close a the circle there from last time I talked about my headaches with getting, uh, well, you see the Arduino on the left and the uh, green pill on the right there. And I, I, I had some issue getting the BNO85 and the OLED display sort of both working um reliably and uh, wasn't sure what was going on and sometimes the bno 85 didn't seem like it wanted to work and so after a lot more debugging with the logic analyzer i did eventually and and actually after sort of following some suggestions here from the group which i'm grateful for i did it did turn out that i had two problems that you know in a way came in together and made it harder to figure this out. But number one, it did turn out that the SparkFun library that I was using for the BNO85 seemed a little bit inferior to the art of Adafruit library. And, and you know, I don't know why, but the SparkFun library just, uh, it seemed like occasionally it's not succeeding in initializing the BNO085. You know, and 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 so where the Adafruit library is, seems like it's doing a slightly different initialization procedure. And you know, from what I've seen so far, that one just works spot on all the time. So okay, different library, better results, but still not 100% successful. So it did turn out that the OLED display it was also a source of trouble. I initially thought it wasn't the case. But it turns out the OLED display occasionally goes into a state by where it just pulls down one of the I squared C lines and holds it down. That's it. I, I, I couldn't figure out what's going on initially because when I start pulling wires, I, you know, I wasn't close attention what device I disconnected. At one point, I almost success, you know, uh, suspected the Cortex M4, you know, my, my green pill, as being the culprit. And I kept resetting it and nothing was changing now, but but I was, you know, was looking at the wrong pins. And in the end, it was the OLED that, you know, it gets into state. I don't know how and why. And again, maybe the SparkFun library, the way it's talking on the I squared C bus, I'm just wondering if it confused the OLED display even more often. But the OLED, once it's in the state where it, it pulls down an, an I squared C line, nobody can talk anymore, right, on the bus. And Chris, and so, that, was the, that was the problem that was causing, I think it was your SDL line to... Yeah, to that was, that was the go. problem where my, my SDA line was low. I had a separate problem of not being able to talk to the, you know, the BNO85. That was more of a library problem. But, you know, both problems were happening kind of at the same time. But, yeah, the OLED, and I should have known because I've seen it before even when I've just the OLED connected and I I hit reset, you know, or download new code, I've seen it before where the OLED stops working and I have to power cycle the OLED. So I, I should have suspected it much earlier than I did. And one lesson learned here is, you know, when talking to peripherals, you know, when having a choice, use a peripheral that has a dedicated reset line because that OLED doesn't have a reset input. I can't reset the OLED. Okay, I can reset the BNO85. I can, you know, 
depending on who you consider the master, if my pie is the master, I can reset my, you know, my, my green pill processor, but the OLED has only power, ground, and I squared C, I cannot reset it. So unfortunately, you know, it's, that's, you know, it's working fairly reliably, but again, every once in a while it gets into that state. So I, I need to find another display, maybe even with a spy for a little faster update rate and it's something with a dedicated reset input because this is just, you know, otherwise not, uh, you know, I wanted to, I don't need it 100.0% reliable, but a little bit more reliable than, than what I have right now. Yeah, why can't you just add a, uh, a, a solid state or an opto in there it could be really to turn that power on and off, right? Yep. Now I was thinking along those lines, and I mean, maybe maybe even that is not necessary. I mean, the OLED doesn't use any power. I, I haven't measured it, but yeah. those things yeah. are very low power, power, right? If you could power it right off one of those GPIO fans, great, right? I might be able to, but I was I tried um, like disconnecting. I don't know. I'm from what was I tried? I is either disconnected VCC or ground. I connect disconnected just one. The OLED was still on because it was still getting power, enough power through the I squared C lines. It light itself up. Oh, that sucks. So I I think yeah. So so. I'd have to sort of play with it more to see if I could get away with just either VCC or just ground, you know, disconnecting that and controlling it through a GPIO line. I mean, there might be a way to do it. I haven't tried enough of it, but but the bottom line is, you know, it, you got to have stuff that you can explicitly reset. Otherwise, you can get yourself into a pickle. So that was one thing. Uh, then, so the other thing, as you can see here, I have a couple sensors just physically placed here as a mock-up. I'm, I'm starting to, I am starting to sort of add some sensors for obstacle avoidance. And that's one of the reasons why I need my co-processor so I have more IO. And so I am just playing around with positioning of different things. As you can see, the, the ultrasonic, you know, bulky. I mean, that the Romy platform is not that big. And so we start, it starts, Starting to get tight here, right? Uh, you can see a bunch of wires here from my uh, QTR line array going up into the Romy controller. And yeah, I'm not using the thinnest of wires here. So it's it's getting crowded. And so I'm just experimenting with different physical positioning. Um, this, this is a standard sharp IR. You know, they're obviously uh, smaller and, you know, maybe a little bit easier to place. Um, Playing around a little bit with the USB wiring because, again, I do plan on having a USB link to my green pill. And um, the standard USB cables, again, they tend to be fairly, you know, robust with the connectors, but but a bit more bulky. So it gets, again, crowded there in the front. If I, if I plug a real USB cable in, uh, it, it gets a little a little crowded there in the front. And, and so uh, I have have these just these are just USB male, you know, um, little, little breakout USB type A male connectors that I'm thinking of just just soldering a couple wires to just to have something that's as you know as low profile as possible just so I don't have as much bulk going on. Honestly I don't I don't know if I'm gonna have the signal integrity I need for USB, but I'm going such a short distance it might not be an issue. Um, and and so I'm going to give that a try, just just to cut back on the bulky cables a little bit. Um, yeah. So that's 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 really all. Nothing's wired up, and and uh, you know, so that's where I'm at with my with my Romy. Uh, Chris, so you got to uh, get a bit on there if you, if you add any more. Those little wheels are going to be splaying out, you know, under the load. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wait until I have my third deck on there, right, with the yeah, LiDAR on yeah. top. And I think I'm getting a little bit, uh, yeah, it's going to start be overloaded. Yep. Chris, your troubleshooting with the uh, I2C interface is uh, uh, very interesting. And I think uh, the fact that, if I understand correctly, you actually had kind Sorry, of Sorry, you cut out, Dave, you just cut out for like five seconds. Uh, how about now? No. In and out. I'll wait. You're in and out with the audio. It's like 50% duty cycle. Yeah, I can hear you. 
Can you? Hey, nope. Is that? Oh, oh, oh I'm you just gotta, You got to power into the enable pin. <laughs> what I was trying to get through was that because you had two overlapping problems, <clears throat> and that makes the troubleshooting that much harder. And you're an experienced troubleshooter, but I wonder about some of our other robot builders who might have run into similar things. Yeah, I mean, I was banging my head against the wall, and, and I've done this sort of thing for a while. And so, yeah, it, it's when you have two things going on that maybe one is amplifying the other, maybe they're unrelated. It, I, you know, it's hard to tell. I didn't really want to get to the ultimate root cause here. Uh, but, yeah, it, it, can get, it can get tricky when you have multiple things going on. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the day, you know, systematic trial and error, um, if you keep track of it, which, which, you know, if I don't, I, I do, you know, it's easy to end up going in circles, right? If you're not diligently keeping track of what you've tried, what the result was, because after mm -hmm. you've tried three different things, you're going to start forgetting what the, what the result of the first thing was, right? So if I don't, I, I probably didn't keep enough track of it that I probably went in circles a couple times unnecessarily. And, and, you know, so I think that's, that's what, what people need to realize. And, you know, the logic analyzer, as simple as it is and cheap, you know, it obviously is, is immensely useful. Hey, Chris, are you programming in Python? Was it? No, that one was on the green pill. That's just the cortex M4, uh, you know, just, just regular C. Well, I mean, in C, I guess you could kind of do the same thing. What I was going to suggest, and which is hardly anything new to you, I'm sure, but to the group, is that um, I'm in Python, and there's a Python library called PyTest. And if you call PyTest on the command line in a directory with a bunch of files that have underscore test.py, basically following a pattern, you can, it'll automatically fire up all of those files and run them as a test suite. And there's, you know, for Java, for all programming languages, something like that. But PyTest is how I kind of keep everything running in that I've got a whole bunch of test files. And after I've put my robot back together after taking it apart, I run PyTest. And you can exclude tests that you don't want to run. But basically, it runs through all these tests and tries all the different things. And invariably, there'll be something broken that I hadn't noticed, like something wasn't connected properly or, you know, that kind of thing. But the idea is to have what they call unit tests that run on each part of your robot when you first fire it up after reassembling it, and you'll find something invariably, then you go and fix that. But you fix all the component. They call it unit tests. Each separate part is tested individually, and then if everything runs, then you don't need to run PyTest again. And yeah. that's kind of how I keep sane with my project is that otherwise I wouldn't know what was broken when I reassemble things. No, I think that the, definitely the notion of or the concept of some built-in self-test, you know, it's been whenever you mess around with your robot a lot, it's, it's going to be immensely useful. Now, in this case, again, when, when you have multiple things sharing a single resource, and mm -hmm. that resource here is the I2C bus, you know, any kind of built-in test, which in a way I had going on on startup, I initialized the OLED, put something up, I initialized, you know, I had print apps going on, not not sort of automated in any way, but, but you have a shared resource. And if one device kind of renders that resource unusable, mm -hmm. everybody else who's trying to use that resource is going to fail, right? right. And, and you don't necessarily know who the culprit is. So one thing I, I started doing and, and thinking about it some more, I should do going forward whenever I use I2C on startup, I'm just going to sense the two bus lines, because if they're low, something is wrong, right? I mean, if everybody just started up, you know, give it a few milliseconds, but there's no reason why, I mean, if I'm the one who is controlling who talks on the bus and when, and everybody sort of starts talking, you know, after a couple dozen milliseconds, the bus lines should all be high, right? Mm -hmm. So the moment I read a low on the bus, I know something's wrong with the hardware. So I think that's one thing I learned. If I use I2C, I'm going to have to do that. Um, I enabled the watchdog timer on the Cortex-M4. I figured, you know, why not? I mean, again, in this case, resetting resetting my ARM processor, you know, didn't help because the OLED was a separate device. But I figured, hey, probably not a bad idea either. 
having a watchdog enabled. Um, yeah, and, and explicitly controlling reset of whatever I can control, like the BNO 85, where at one point during my troubleshooting last week, I already mentioned I was explicitly controlling the resetting of the BNO 085. Probably a good idea so that I know when it gets reset. Just can't do that with the OLED. So, um, you know, there's a couple of things I guess I learned. I mean, I should have known really in a way, but just kind of. Uh, relearned to uh, realize again how important some of those things are, like explicitly resetting things, so you sh you're sure you know when it was reset, etc. Yeah. Well, one thing I was just thinking, um, like in, 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 there's a Python library called SM Bus, and I've used it to write a I squared C bus scanner. And so I've got a little library, and when I first fire up my robot, it goes out and scans for particular addresses and knows whether that device has been plugged in or not. You could, in theory, obviously. I was see a bit actually, I, I, I was doing my my green pill code in, in the Arduino framework, and I, I picked grabbed some sample code for doing exactly that. So that was one of the things I did on startup. I was scanning through the bus, and again, every once in a while, it's like, why am I not finding any devices on the I2C bus? What the heck is going on? Yeah. Um, isn't I2C multi-master? And I, I thought they had provisions for like collisions, like if to try to control. Yeah, the I, to be honest, I'm not even, I don't even want to try that out. As it is, it's tricky to get work, right? And then you, you yeah. have devices that don't behave properly, like the OLED. I'm not sure I ever, I ever want to try multi-master, but, but you, you're right. Yeah, I wonder if maybe that's something that's going on, maybe. Now, yeah, but all of my devices are, the b &O, you know, is designed to act as a slave, right? Unless, yeah unless it has a software bug and it's doing something different. The OLED is designed to be a slave. It's not designed to be a master. So the only master in my setup was the green pill board. Yep. Well, one of the things that uh, you might want to look into, uh, I've had a problem with collisions on the I squared bus too. Uh, and that is, is that they make um, expansion shields uh, for the I squared C bus, which allows you to, in effect, isolate some of the bus. Mm -hmm. So that, in effect, in effect uh, I think they have uh, four. Oh, is, is that what they use if you have two devices that have the same address and you have no control over it, and it's kind of a way yeah. to make them all work? Yes, that is a yeah. way too. But, but it's also, since you can isolate things, it says if somebody's being a bad guy, you can shut them off. Oh, so you have for every device, you get like a separate enable signal that you then. No, what, kind of... no, what it is is that, uh, okay, are you familiar with the uh, level shifter where, where it has a uh, MOS device? Well, it's yeah. like a level shifter where you turn the device on and off, which isolates that leg of the bus. Okay, so you need one GPI, additional GPIO line per device then? No, no, it has an address too. Oh. Okay, and uh, you send it a 8-bit pattern, which tells it which of the buses to turn on. Oh, okay. Interesting. So that's something to think about. I know I had a problem with uh, a uh, smart uh, line following board uh, that would hang up the bus. And uh, so I, I've discovered things hang up the bus too. And uh, one of the thoughts was, well, maybe use that. And that way you can programmatically shut it, people down and see who's the culprit. That's a good idea. Well, there's this little guy, which is a I squared C multiplexer. And so it's from Adafruit. Uh, it's called a TCA 9548A. They're about seven dollars, and it allows you to have multi. You know, you, you can address. You basically plug different. You're, you're basically getting a bunch of different devices with addressable. Um, how to put it? What's a multiplexer? I don't know. I don't need to describe that to you guys. You know what a multiplexer yeah. is. Yeah. Can you um, put that number in the chat, Murray? Yeah. Yeah. We'll do. In fact, that, I'll just find, I'll find the link. 
I haven't actually needed it yet, but um, because most of the devices I've been using have a little solder thing on the back where I can change the address. But um, the one that I couldn't find that for was the uh, the uh, optical flow uh, sensor, and that one didn't have that. So if I wanted to have two of those, I was going to have to use that. That's why I bought this. But uh, yeah, I'll put the link in. Yeah, that's basically the kind of device I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Actually, cool. I, ha I have some news in that regard. Um, I know that uh, both I and uh, Kareem had contacted Pimeroni about the optical flow sensor that they sell because the actual sensor on their board is for drones, so it's meant for long distances. And I'd found a short distance sensor, and I just today an email was corresponding with one of their techs. And they said that they've actually gone to the trouble now of purchasing a bunch of those short range sensors, but because of the, uh, the release of the Raspberry Pi Pico, they've been overloaded and busy, but they've actually bought the sensors and they're planning now to go ahead and try prototyping the board. So it's, it's, it's on you know, some kind of schedule now. So hopefully we'll have a short, term, a short distance uh, optical flow sensor at some point, which would be really cool. That is for your visual odometry. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Well done. And the benefit of this other sensor is that the, the, the one that's currently available for drones is kind of tuned for like landscape, whereas the one that's for short range is actually, you know, it's an actual sensor for industry. It was tuned for much smoother surfaces, so it can actually differentiate like tile and, and concrete and things like that and get a better signal off of a short range, smoother surface than you would with this current sensor. So it'll be kind of ideal for robots, I think. They give a timeline? No, unfortunately. I, I was hoping. Well, maybe we'll get to play soon. Yeah, that, that the, what the, the person said was that they would go ahead and nudge the tech team that there was lots of interest, so. Murray, are you using a uh, mirror? Huh? Mounting, it, mounting your uh, that little sensor at an ang at a ninety degree angle and looking down through a mirror through a hole in the in the bottom. Oh essentially yeah. Essentially moving your optical uh, distance farther away. Yeah. It well actually the the distance for that sensor is about I think it was eighty five millimeters and when I I actually did a blog post about this and I mounted it at eighty five. And that's roughly the, like my platform, my three millimeter platform on my robot is about 90 mil. So it would function and I, I tested it and it does function, but even still, I'd like to mount it down like, you know, maybe more like 30 or 40 mil and aim it right at the ground and also be assured that it would work on a smooth surface. And, and this sensor is not really tuned for that. So, I mean, it's tuned for looking at trees and stuff like that, I think. But you're saying the new one is something you could mount like on the bottom of your robot? Yeah, I'm not sure what the actual minimum distance is, but it's meant for short range. So I, I have, in fact, I probably, either Kareem or I probably found that particular sensor. It's the same company. I, I can't remember who makes it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's tuned for short distances. So I think that you can probably put it quite a bit closer. I think it's designed in industry for things passing on conveyor belts or something like that. So it's probably meant to go pretty close to the object. That's cool. I tried doing yeah. that with an optical mouse once, but uh, didn't get it to work at all. No, yeah, there's been lots of stuff with optical mice trying, but there's all sorts of problems with that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Where did you get your OLED displays from? Were they Chinese? Um, well, I'm sure they are where I actually purchased from. I, I probably, probably Amazon because yeah, I haven't done any AliExpress yet. Not a lot of eBay lately. So there were Amazon, but forgot the brand name, maybe WaveShare. Yeah, that's a common one. Yeah, I kind of wonder if the, if the ones we get from Adafruit wouldn't have these issues, you know, because the other ones are <laughs> yeah. They're very cheap. Well maybe the one from Adafruit have have reset pin, right? I mean it's convenient to have only four pins, but yeah again you gotta be able to and I have I've run into this sort of issue at work before. I mean USB is notorious for you know anytime you talk to another device and you can't reset it or 
maybe even probably power cycle it to be honest right i mean it if you want something ultra reliable it just you can't you can't get there okay cool uh anyone uh, want to dump in okay then yeah I'll, jump in. I'll go ahead right okay well what i was working on i had um uh basically a it's a right angle gear motor um and this one actually had access to the back and it had these it actually has a one eighth square recess or hole in the back of it and i had to turn that down to put the, the little magnet on the top of it down to two millimeters and um then i you know i could just push it in the back of the motor and uh, you know on, on top of the encoder and i had never used um well i had a i had a three jaw chuck on there on the lathe and i had never taken it off before because i was afraid of screwing things up and so i just decided okay well i can't i can't center something square with a three jaw chuck and i actually had a 5c collet that had a one eighth that would hold you know a piece of one eighth stock so i'm taking off the three jaw chuck, which is mounted on a faceplate, so I, I don't, I didn't weigh it, but maybe it weighs 20 pounds or something. I'm screwing it off, and I'm screwing it off, and it just, when it reaches the end, it just drops, and it pinched the hell out of one of my fingers. It's like hitting your one of your fingers with a hammer, basically. And um, so, got that out of the way. Um, used the five C call. It worked, worked great. Um, took that all off and found a four jaw chuck and that, that I had never never had on there and uh, so put that on there and you know just kind of played around with that you know trying to see how accurately you could position stuff or if, it, if there was any wobble and um, that looked good so I decided to take that off and you know I thought okay well this one's lighter and smaller I won't you know I'll catch it as it comes to the end of the the threads yeah yeah and uh, like the one Dave is holding up, pretty heavy, yeah. Anyway, so same thing happens, but I crush another finger, you know. So now I have like you know one finger on each hand that's kind of like been hit with a hammer. You know, you only have so many of those. You only have so many of those, man. I know, I know. Anyway, so uh, and you know, I've seen people use a board. You know, you take it off so you don't damage the waves by dropping it onto the the waves of the lathe. You know, and the board kind of acts as a little little buffer and so um you know lesson learned always use a board <laughs> they're just a lot heavier than you think you are but ray you realize that once you've healed up from those finger injuries you'll be able to play violin <laughs> really how why is that it's just it's one of those stupid jokes from cartoons you know oh okay yeah, like yeah doc when i get healed can i play the violin well yeah well good because i couldn't play it before so, Harold's yeah. got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, anyway. I I watch a lot of cartoons. That's made my brain is mush. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs> what I want to know is, if you had a third <laughs> chuck, would you would you hurt a third finger? <laughs> uh, I might, you know. You never can tell. No, I'm I'm going to use a board and you know keep my hands out from underneath it. So that... I think I learned that in grade ten. Really? Yeah. yeah. Use a board. A quick learner, then. <laughs> or, no, you just, don't, you don't like want to change the way. I don't think it's you're not you're not going to damage that chuck, but you can damage the ways on the. Oh yeah, yeah. And that so you know that's that's hard to pick. The ways. Yeah. yeah. So so I'm glad to hear you sacrificed your fingers in order to save the the ways on the way that that was a good that was a good decision yeah yeah i figure i'll heal you know the, the ways won't you know they'll, they'll be damaged so you know but uh it seems to be working i had um another oled display from china and um i was using it um you know just to do like you know the number of coder counts per the the linear movement of the linear rail and stuff like that and um when i took the uh the oled display code out it stopped working 
So it's like, oh no. So I have there's some timing issue going on with it, it needs that delay to, you know, throw you know the word in. Uh, I think encoder count and whatever the count, the numeric count is, on there. And uh, I, I'm looking it over, and I was thinking, oh, this this can't be, you know. But there's something in there, my flaw in the logic. So, but anyway, that's that's what I've been working on. So on that on your issue, so you said you took something out and then it stopped working. I mean, one one possible scenario may not be in your case, but um, if you have all the optimizations turned on in your code, and if you got something on going on with things accessing global variables, including interrupts, sometimes when you take code out, uh -huh. the compiler's optimization. Is able to kick in and and sort of mess things up, right? I mean, I'm assuming mm -hmm. you, you have to make sure everything is declared as a volatile if you're doing right. C, right? And it's a global variable and it's being accessed from the interrupt and elsewhere. Make sure it's volatile because I've seen that before. You have a printf, and you know the fact that you're printing some information means now that variable is getting access, so now the compiler can't just willy-nilly throw out the code. Right, that's yeah, that's yeah. that's behind some of it, but now you yeah. take out the printf and the compiler thinks, oh, nobody needs this. I'm just going to optimize this away, right? And stuff yeah. stops working. So throw in a okay. couple of volatiles and see what happens. All right. Yeah, I thought I already had these volatile, but uh, I'll check. Maybe maybe not all of them were declared as volatiles, but uh, um, yeah, it's it's kind of a weird thing. It's like, okay, well, I don't really need that code in there now. I got everything. So I'll just comment it out, comment it out, and it's not working anymore. It's kind of like, oh, I can put it back in. It works again. Yeah, or you were doing things too fast, right? Maybe you're pounding on something too fast with the code yeah. taken out. You know, you, you're trying to do something at a rate that you're not allowed to do it at. That's possible, yeah. Um, I had, um, instead of using delays, I was using, like, um, you know, past millis and cur current millis and looking for a certain count between them. And so I didn't have to use delay or, or the delay statement, but um, um, I, I found another another way to write the code. I'm gonna try that and see if, uh, uh, without any display code at all and see if it, you know, if it works okay. But um, anyway, yeah, flaws in logic, I guess. Cool. All right. I think uh, I think I'll jump in at this point now. Let me try and share this way. I don't know if it's optimal or not, but uh, it's a big screen way to do things. So you should be able to see. Okay. All right. So what I've got here is uh, a hover hovercraft simulator guy, and. Uh, I've been working on the BNO55 on this thing. And a little while back, I had the heading loop closed. So uh, with my remote here, I can turn it on. And you can see that uh, even though it's only using the uh, magnetometer once, uh, it, it's uh, I have it in uh, IMU mode plus mode. So it, it, uh, it, it basically, uh, the F means it's using the fusion mode. One means it's uh, synchronized or calibrated. But I'm, because it's IMU plus, it's only using the gyroscope and the accelerometer. And since there are three, it means that um, the fusion mode is in sync. But it turns out that uh, the heading is actually pretty accurate, uh, even though uh, it's not really calibrated or anything. So. Um, what I can do is is I can uh, turn on the loop and I have a, a kind of a test mode now. So that, um, it always tries to aim to, I have a set point set to, uh, go ahead, question. I have a, I have a heading loop, uh, I have a heading loop set on the absolute uh, closed loop. So I give it zero to 360 and it attempts to hold that position. And then I have this funky logic so that 
if it's on one side or the other, it'll always try and take the shortest path. So it won't go all the way around like three quarters to get there. So if I turn on the heading loop, so that's about north. And uh, you can see that if I, uh, if I pick it up uh, this way, it aims north. If I turn the other way, it aims north. So it's kind of nice. It likes to go to the north. Well, 10 degrees, I have a set point 10 degrees to the right of north. But I, I found an interesting thing where you can see that uh, and it, it's got to get tuned. It's not very accurate right now. But you can see that it's um it's it's pretty good. All right, it'll keep up with it. Not even walk off the table. Um, find its way home. But there's this funny problem that happens. <coughs> you see that glitch? So right at the right at the zero crossing, right about right about the zero um, when the heading is transitions from. 360 to zero, you can maybe hear it better than see it in the video, but it, uh, I got something going on I have to trace down. I figure it's either a flaw in my convoluted logic that understands uh, to, to try and take the shortest path, or then maybe the, uh, maybe the sensor is throwing some out of bounds value, like outside of zero to 360, and it's, and it's causing things to misbehave. Is the sensor giving you zero to three sixty or minus one eighty to plus one eighty? Well, it's supposed to be zero to three sixty, and I mean that's what um, that's what it shows if, if you look at it all the time. Um, like this is one fourteen. Whoops, it's not very easy to see. I guess this is three forty. So right around three fifty seven, three fifty nine to zero. So as far as I know, it's it's well formed in the range it's supposed to be, but there's there's something about how, what I'm doing, or I don't know, there's something in there. But it's only in the one direction because when you go this direction, it doesn't happen, and with other set points, so it's it's whenever the uh, the velocity is low and it crosses that boundary, there's some kind of boundary error in the. In yeah. The I mean, What's I always find loop? myself. I always find myself having to put. Well, first of all, I usually find that things like to be between minus one eighty and plus one eighty, normalized in that fashion. But but that's, but in either way, yeah, you gotta make sure. I mean, I always find issues with the, with the math when you have this sort of crossing, because you got this circular thing going on with angles. And so it, I'm pretty sure it's just something silly where you're subtracting some angles or doing some angle math, and, and that just doesn't work properly in those corner cases. Yeah, I'm missing an equals, greater than equals or something. Carl, are you using a quaternion library? No, no, I'm not quite that fancy. Um, I'm just taking the uh, the the BNO55 in, um, in its normal fusion mode, and, and for that, it outputs zero to 360. Yeah. Um, and then I have, uh, anyhow, and then because I'm using, I'm using like the standard uh, Arduino, that one uh, PID library, um, I couldn't figure out how to, how to normalize things to plus or minus 180. So I just let it be an absolute number. And then the feedback loop has this branching logic that normalizes it in effect to plus or minus 180. The only thing I can think is maybe just as an experiment would be to try using radian. Yeah, like is there a math problem? Well, it doesn't really change anything. You, you still have a zero crossing, right? You still, yeah, you yeah, still have the circular thing. It's just a different scale. Well, well I, I found that. I'm well, just I found... that might tease out the problem. Yeah, well, I found one way to deal with a lot of this is to use vectors and so you could uh use the angles like they're vectors and then add them up and you can that way you can do stuff like take an average and by just adding the two vectors and then normalizing it so um <clears throat> that gets around a lot of the issues with uh crossing uh the zero 360 boundary 
Hey Dave, actually, you you had a solution for that, didn't you? Just add 360, and then you don't yeah. have to. Your range of angles never goes below 360, right? I didn't ask for that. No. <laughs> no. No. The um. Um. Okay. All right. You're. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about the um, sensors on the. Um, uh, the wheel sent the uh, hmm, PID sensors, and uh, so very different beast. Hmm. Carl, I, I have I a. Think it was an issue with math. It, if you added 360 to all your your angles, you never you never had to worry about going from zero because you always had something greater than 360, and it was basically the same angle. I, it's oh, probably I not. Sorry, go ahead, David. That's all right. I, w I was just going to say I don't think it's probably that that difficult. You'll you'll find the bug pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, it, it you know the zero crossing handling is not uh, it's not that tough. Um, like in our PID loop controller has a continuous mode, and you tell it what you know where where the um, uh, where it crosses zero, and you so you can scale it to whatever. Uh, that is, and uh, and once you have that figured out, um, it'll probably be smooth sailing. I'm 99% sure there's nothing wrong with the um, with the IMU's output. Yeah. Well, I have a, a halfway solution to that that I've used before. I don't know if any of y'all looked at the the code that Chris gave us a couple of months ago, uh, but he has to do the same thing I had been doing, which is that there you're while you do the math, you're constantly calling this function that is going to clip you to plus or minus a 180. You have to do that every time you do a, an addition or a subtraction or whatever. And, uh, basic, and that's basically what I was doing also. But I found an easier solution to that is I actually keep two uh, global thetas. I keep them in radians. And one of them is the one that scales plus and minus 180. But the other one just accumulates endlessly. And that is, I don't clip it. Uh, so if you want to rotate 90 degrees, you just grab that number and add 90 to it, and it tells you which direction that you need to point. So you don't have to do all of that uh, correction. Uh, basically, it key, there's one uh, <clears throat> there's one heading which is clipped to minus to zero plus minus 180, but there's another heading which is unrestrained. It just winds up and unwinds as the robot drives around. And therefore, you can ignore having to do those uh, those corrections, and that's the one that I use for doing that. For example, when I'm uh, uh, when you've seen the robot drive while spinning, uh, that's how those things are calculated. Uh, and same with same with other, uh, you know, if you want to drive through a certain 15 degrees, well, okay, suppose you're at you know at 355, and I want to rotate uh, clockwise. So I'm going to rotate to 310. So you actually have to do the math twice there to, to do the clip. Whereas if that number is, you know, 5,680, then you're going to go through 5,695. You don't care what the intermediate values are. Do you, uh, right initialize, do you initialize that to some large number, right? Because if you don't, there's still a point in time where you have the problem of the zero crossing. So do you initialize that 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 accumulation angle to like fifty thousand, right? And then you work from there. Now, well, well I, I, I just let it start at zero, but it winds up pretty quickly. Mm. Uh, I, I guess what you're saying is, is, is that if it was turning about the same amount of left and right, that it would still go through. Uh, there, there is a solution to that, and uh, uh, Ray. Uh, uh, finally stimulated the nerves in the back of the head. Um, back Way back when, uh, when we were doing navigation stuff at TI, we used BAMS, binary angle measures. And what that is, is that you convert your angles into a an essentially a fractional value. And so when it overflows, 
it just goes wraps around just like your angles wrap around. Yeah, so it'd be an unsigned int or something. Yes, exactly. Or you could use sign, it doesn't matter because it wraps. And and it, they're, they're called, if you look it up you uh, on Google, BAM, binary angle measure. Huh. All right. Interesting. Oh, cool. Well, thanks for all the advice. It'll be interesting to see. I, I'm just really uh, struggling because I, I don't think that there should be this discontinuity like that. Um, so I, I figure I might have a, a bad equation in there somewhere. Carl, can you Carl, add your you, discontinuity? Oh, did you sorry. look in chat, Carl? I put in an equation for your 180 to minus 180. Yeah, I found, Doug, I found one like that before um, from some other things, but it didn't, I mean, the way they have the math constructed in the, in the algorithm, it, 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 um, those weren't lending itself to the way I was doing it. Okay, but that, that works real well. I use it a lot when I'm trying to correct data, uh, um, otherwise in my PID loops, when I'm trying to take the error from the, he the heading error, I, I find it easier that if the heading error is zero, it's zero. And if it's positive, it's one direction, and if it's negative, it's another direction. So 180, minus, 180 to minus 180 works real well in that, met in that, that type of function. So anyway, I, I put that on there, and that also takes out the the, like if you wind around three times and you have 360 times three times, that equation will take that all out and it, you'll just be working, the range will literally be 180 to minus 180. So I got it in there and you can look it over. If you guys yeah. don't like it, you can do it another time. No, so, thanks. But you know. I, I'm guessing, so this is a relative, those are relative measures though too, right? Not absolute? No, I mean, uh, but you have to, those are going to be if you're going to have a heading set and like if you want to go north for example and you want to have that as your starting reference there's a couple of ways one you could start your robot pointed north uh, that'd be one way or you can simply put uh, an offset to the number uh, huh? forever wherever you're going to go haven't you just converted your problem from uh, facing north to facing south, though? Yeah, but you're going to be, well, no. In that one case, you're actually, what you're doing is you're putting the problem, the transover problem, behind you. Right, right. but there's still a but, problem. But, it's just behind well, you instead of in front yeah. of you. Yeah, well, you're going forward a lot more often than you're going backwards. Mm -hmm. All right, and so, you know, if you're going forward and you're bouncing around, say, plus 10 to minus 10, because you're, you're really close to your heading that you want to be at anyway. And then all of a sudden you get a command that says you got to go 90 degrees from where you are. Well, you know, you'll go 90 degrees. If you said you're going to go 180, well, yeah, you're going to, your robot's going to try to go turn around. But it's not, it, unless you, unless you're using some form of, uh, uh, rotate in place function, your your robot's going to turn. It's not going to go like that. Oh, okay. mine will. I mean, the, the, uh, yeah, the cannon okay. wheel or differential wheel, right? So. Well, no, not even. I don't think you'll find, if you're pit looping along and all of a sudden you give it a 180 degree turn, I think you'll oh, see sure. that it, it'll, 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 It'll rot. It'll turn around, but it, it will take some space. But usually, what I do in something like that is that if if the if the error is greater than a certain amount, then I I turn on a flag saying turn in place, and it, it turns until that number comes back in control. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, that works well too. You mentioned previously uh, twice. You said zero through three hundred and sixty, and same thing with zero through plus or minus one hundred and eighty. Are you certain that those values are? In other words, you should never see three hundred and sixty, right? You should see fifty and three hundred and fifty-nine point nine 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 nine. That's zero. 
that's are you certain question. that you're you're certain that you're not seeing 360 no i'm not i i haven't had a chance to check that yet and well that can, that can cause a problem as you go through zero that's what i'm thinking and and plus i'm thinking that uh you know, not knowing how the guts of the IMU work in the fusion mode, for all I know, it's got some filter on its computed value that has a little bit of a ringy ding. So it might, you know, as you're as you're rotating slowly in one way, it might get I'm tracking, tracking, tracking. Oh, whoops, 360.1. I better go back to zero. We we crossed. So I know Kareem said it's it's not so likely, but that's I can tell you do. that's not happening. That's I, not okay. I, I'm hundred percent sure. Okay. I should have I should have gone with 100 percent the first time. Damn it! Damn <laughs> it! It would be so easy to play. It's your code, else. dude. Own it. It's my oh, own. Uh, okay. If you rotate very slowly, does it still glitch? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, even well, very slowly. It, okay. It, it's very slowly. It glitches in the one way, not the other way. So let me. Uh, uh, can uh, you detect a large jump in the error? Maybe that's well, that's, I, that's where you. I don't have this. this I don't want to have this stuff that that tries to compensate for the size of the error because I I want it to be well behaved at whatever speed it's capable of doing. So um. So I, oh I guess I should share it if you want to see it. Um. Was that so I I want to I want to try and solve this in the way that it's it's well behaved. I mean no matter what the set point is. No matter what angle it's turning through, there. And are you graphing your error as you experience that? No, I'm not graphing squat. I, I wrote it and scratched my head for a bunch of hours on the algebra and finally got it this far. And then I ran out of time. I'll bet your error and not the actual heading that you're getting from the IMU um, is, is janky. Something's probably going on there. Is janky. Sorry, that's oh, yeah. a high tech yeah, well, this, term. And that's the whole thing because the um, or I have a I have a kind of a sketch not digitized or anything, but yeah. Here I'll show you on the camera. So janky. Did, did that happen? This uh, this um, sudden jump. I didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's kind of hard to show in this video, but. Okay. This, okay. So basically, so basically, right. I have the uh, the reference set point coming in over here, right, and then um, forget this other nonsense, and then um, so I have uh, the set point in the range of zero to three sixty here. So it's an absolute set point, and then um, I have a, I give turn commands to the motors, so they're scaled plus or minus a hundred to make the motors go or to make it turn max to, to, zero, to, to plus max to minus max rate. And then that eventually turns into a heading, which, so it, the IMU spits out an absolute zero to 360. So what I have in this magic block here, where we're, we're convincing me that the, the error lies, this magic block takes zero to 360, and then it computes uh, based on the set point and the current heading. Uh, it, it computes a value here so that the set point minus this value gives the expected error. Does that make sense? So that's, I have this, I think the error is probably in here somewhere um, because there's some, some if thens and branches to, to make it work out so that it always gives the right error here. Because the summing node is in the, the pit loop library that I'm using from Arduino. So I can't go in there and, and change it around that easily. So I thought I'd, just have the correction external to the summing node. Can you detect a jump in that error? Like beyond 50 degree or something, and then print some stuff out? Oh yeah, I mean, I can I, I can plot, I, I should be doing that to plot the values and figure it out, but like I haven't had a chance to get in there yet, so. Yep. Got it. Other details. We're also, uh, a, a quick note about the uh, um, always going the shortest direction. Yeah, um, that's uh, my team has been doing that for um, years, and uh, this year we run into a situation where that's a bad thing, um, and we need to be um, 
uh, observant of the direction that it chooses to go because there are configurations of the robot where um, the turret can hit other parts of the robot depending upon, you know, we're doing it with two at two stages. We're doing it both at the base uh, rotating by IMU and the turret by IMU. And there are some configurations depending upon um, the direction both are facing where, um, you know, there's going to be an internal uh, collision. So a little sometimes you got to turn it off. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it's like slapping yourself <laughs> in the face. So it's going to shoot a pre-created loader or something. Carl, I don't know if you remember this, but some years ago when we were running at Quick Trip, um, one of my robots and you had, I think it was you had questioned uh, when it gets to the waypoint, how does it decide which way to turn? having noticed that sometimes it turned clockwise and sometimes it turned counterclockwise, even though it looked like it was going 180 degrees in both cases. And the answer to that is that it depends on a fractional amount of being off of the straight line when it comes into the final waypoint. It's taking a shorter path. So one path might be a half shorter than the other. And, and, it, and basically, when it come in on the final waypoint, it's not actually up in 100% straight, coming in slightly at a tank. So that determines. So that that basically was like what you're looking at now. Yeah. So I'm just playing catch up. I'll get there. <laughs> Between David Anderson and the high school guys, they've been doing it for years. So it can be done. <laughs> I didn't mean to make it sound trivial. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, that's all right. It, it should be. All these years in college mean something, right? Or do they? I don't know. PowerPoint. Well, as, as I said, for, for my more sophisticated uh, navigation, I actually don't clip it to plus or minus 180. I allow a free, a free uh, accumulating yep. data. Yep. And that makes things easier because you don't have to figure out signs and so forth to do the, the calculation. Interesting points. Interesting idea. I got to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Helpful discussion. All right. So um, who, who else wants to jump in? Uh, I can, oh, go ahead, Donna. Can, oh, okay. Sorry to if I cut somebody else off there. I don't know who that was. So I want to do, it's been a while since I gave any updates on things. And one, the first thing I wanted to mention is on the Seattle robotics side of things. Um, I'm on the events planning committee. And just to let you guys know about something that we're going to have on a, on a virtual uh, front that's going to be coming either late May or early June is probably going to be like early June. We're going to have a what we're going to call a robotics exhibition event that will be entirely virtual. And it'll be a thing where it'll be like a freestyle type of thing where either you can the participant, the builder can showcase a contest type robot, either if you know, some kind of a club contest or a contest of your own devising or just a cool type of project uh, like Chris's Romy robot is a good example of that where they can showcase what it is they've been doing their their challenges that they've encountered their you know the way that they have overcome come those challenges and basically the idea of, of sharing knowledge and also as a these pro, uh, these projects are intended to uh, well, promote the promote the hobby, but also give other builders other ideas in maybe in areas that they hadn't been pursuing for uh, for focus. So that's kind of the idea behind it. It'll it will be a, a structured uh, Q and A uh, introduction uh, demo type of thing, and uh, I'm in the process right now of of updating the Robothon website with some more details on that. Uh, by mid-April, uh, the committee will have, you know, things firmed up more as far as specific dates and, you know, time 
time frames, that kind of thing, uh, for how long a, a builder can present. But I just wanted to let you guys know because I'm hoping that a bunch of you can participate in this, uh, not just as attendees, but actual builders bringing their, their projects and ideas uh, to this event. It will be entirely virtual as far as the builder or group um, you know, providing their own video, uh, being on screen like what we're doing here uh, within this meeting environment where you're actually talking live and, you know, of, uh, feeding questions and providing answers to the to the group uh, live, that kind of thing. But it'll be like pre-recorded video that you can supply uh, for your creation actually doing its thing, whatever its thing is. So I'm hoping that you guys can uh, contribute uh, and participate in that. So that was that's point one that I wanted to make. Irma, may I interrupt? Of course you, you can. Know what, do you know what the time frame for that will be? The reason I ask is because uh, I noticed that the uh, Homebrew Robotics Group out uh, in Portland was doing something similar, and they have limited oh. themselves to five minutes for presentation, which oh. in my humble view is not useful. Five no, minutes I, is not to present anything. So do you have any idea what the... Well, what the, per, yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're definitely going to go uh, longer time frame than that. Probably maybe 15 minutes. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, well, you know, one thing, one thing that I'm tasked uh, to do for this project uh, is to put together a kind of like a, like a demo or a mock-up scenario that can be pre-broadcast uh, as kind of a, an advertising agent to elicit participation. And the idea being that, you know, it'll kind of be a, well, and a, what I'm planning on doing is showcasing one of my robot designs, talking through it, kind of, you know, giving a, 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 a demo as far as what a builder can expect uh, and also um, the, the the overall format, but definitely it will not be as short as five minutes. That seems that seems ridiculous to me. Uh, but I'm thinking maybe 15, 20 minutes. And if we get on the SRS side, if we get a whole bunch of people that are interested in doing this, what we've been what we talked about earlier is that we can run multiple sessions of this in other words you know like it's like uh successive uh, weekends or you know like like take a two-week break and then have another session with it with a new group of builders that type of thing depending on the number of participants that we get i you know i that's all unknown at this point um i'm assuming david that you're talking about the parts uh the portland uh group that's... No, I was actually referring to the Homebrew Robotics Society. Oh, okay. That, right. That's camp, basically Camp Pease. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay, and then I had specifically a question, David, for you. Uh, it seemed to me that at the beginning of this calendar year, when we attended the... Uh, DPRG planning meeting for year 2021, we talked about that you were going to, for a Saturday um, regular meeting session, David, that you were going to be revisiting your outdoor rover navigation uh, scheme. And you were, because you, know, you had some, some new contributions or at least you wanted to revisit it. And I was wondering if you had an idea yet as far as when that was gonna get scheduled um, and that. Oh, you're feeding right into Carl right here. Uh, the actual truth is that when I brought that up, uh, you at the time said, oh, yes, I've read those papers. And okay, I thought, yeah. oh, okay, mm -hmm. oh, okay, doesn't need to be done. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. But, but sure, I, I, I'd be happy to do such a presentation. I uh, have to tell you that my... Uh, my free time has been severely constrained of late because of uh, uh, incidents outside of my control. Uh, but uh, 
Carl, if you want to get me on the calendar, that, that would be a way to get me organized and start thinking about how to do such a presentation. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, the thing. Well, the thing is, though, guys. I mean, if I mean, is there is there interest in that type of presentation beyond just myself? If it's you know, if there isn't a group interest, well, then I'd say forget it. You know. Um, we always like to hear from David. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. David. I see one. I see one from uh, Donna. No, there's a there's a lot of thumbs up. Basically. You know, look at that. See, because okay. I think we've, we've okay. allowed ourselves to become distracted. I think we enjoy being distracted, but there's still this kind of a target to have outdoor competition something in August. And uh, it's, coming uh, up. it's coming up quickly. And we know that at least uh, one person from uh, SparkFun is uh, actively working to dominate the competition. So, uh, so the idea is to try and, and rouse enough interest to get more of more of us to build something for the August. Now I'm thinking of building something. Excellent. Great. Too. So there you have it. And and on I, that I, on that regard, you know, if we just briefly detour the calendar, the um, the the thing we have penciled in so far is that uh, Jesse Brockman was going to talk about his construction in what are we in March? So in the April meeting. And then um, we have penciled in uh, Max and Miro from uh, Europe to talk about their ExoMai uh, rover uh, robot. Um, that was the one that Harold found, basically, that Murray contacted. And then I, so, uh, so, so actually, that would be April, May. So June would be the next Saturday session, David, if you wanted to target something. Notionally, unless one of these other guys drops out, I, I don't know if that fits in with your beyond control circumstances, but Can you send me an email to that effect? I can. Yes, I will do so. That would be a good start. And uh, and Donna, thank you Donna. for hang helping to gang up on David. It's good. Okay. <laughs> I think, Sometimes I think Donna wasn't through, though. Yeah, that is very, I, that is very true. Thank you, David, for segue, seg, giving me that segue. But yes, I wasn't quite through yet. Um, sometimes the uh, female influence uh, can uh, work wonders for uh, twisting arms. So that's why I did that. Okay, the other thing I wanted to report out, I don't know if this is really the time or the place, uh, Carl, as far as giving kind of any kind of updates on the, um, the, the platform, the, the telepre telepresence or remote robot work. I don't know if uh, if you you know if you want to have any commentary on that in this session or if that should be tabled for a different time. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that there's enough interest, uh, even if people aren't active on it, that maybe if we have a brief discussion on, I mean we're. So there's a, a few of us focused on it, and then there's everybody. Mm -hmm. and right. So that, think, exactly. So I think exactly. that if 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 we uh, if we raise a few points for this group on what's going on without dr drilling into details, it might be okay. Okay. And then we and then if we want to drill into details, we can have a separate session. Okay. And to that, All right. Well, to that point, I mean, I'm prepared for the second demo if we want to do it. Um, someone can drive it around here, and we can see in practice how it might work. So, but go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. So I'll, I'll just kind of give just a, a quick overview as far as what I've been looking at and kind of the why on that. Um, again, I don't have a physical robot yet that is uh, any kind of proof of concept for what I've been looking at, but I'll just kind of give you a, a brief idea. So I figured as far as the telepresence remote control robot design, uh, idea is that there would be a lot of of work and traction by the rest of you uh, in looking at that AWS part one and part two. So I decided to just to be different. I decided to look at or at least tease the idea of looking at some other options to realize this design. And so that's kind of the the way that I was looking at this. And so the way that I 
the way that I looked at things was in addition to a, a, a cloud. Now this is on the kind of on the on the server back end side of the house, aside from how physically with hardware and software that the robot itself needs to be Wi Fi connected to make all this work. That's a that's a slightly different ball of wax. But what I'm going to talk about is on the on the web server, the, the back end uh, part of this. And so the way that I decided to look at this is in addition to the AWS potential solution, which of course is a cloud service uh, set of tools and provider. Um, I was also thinking, well, I know that the Raspberry Pi, since it's a, a you know considered a, a powerful uh, mini computer, is I've seen articles and such where it's been utilized as a web server. And I thought, well, this would be a potentially cheaper solution to, uh, to, to start looking there. And <clears throat> so basically, I, I've, I'm like, I think Chris has uh, Comcast too for their internet service provider. And I'm sure most of, many of us here do. And uh, what I, what I found, what I found out, well, let's see, let me back up a bit. So as far as the Raspberry Pi for a web server, that was kind of the way that I decided to start this. In other words, having the Raspberry Pi on the robot itself, um, functioning as a web server and also, um, providing some, like for this demo robot, providing some GPIO and uh, um, interfacing uh, that would then be reflected up on the on the web page website side through that this scene on the web browser. Okay, so that was kind of the way that I was uh, positioning that. And uh, what I found out is that through Comcast um, that you uh, that really what you need to make this whole solution work so that a remote computer so that so that a so that the robot on the web page uh, can be seen outside of your own local network is that you need to have <clears throat> excuse me you need to set you need to be able to have a static external IP address and set up uh, port forwarding all right and so then that started me looking down the on the Comcast side of the house. Well, what is it that through a, a regular Comcast, either I have a business account through them, but I also have for my own personal account, I have I have services. And so I decided to contact them and see, well, what's the charge for having a static external IP address? And you know, really what kind of back end through the router what kind of backend configuration and stuff could I do? And what I found out as a home, regular residential home customer, uh, is that through their um, router configuration platform is that you can easily set up port forwarding uh, that could then directly connect in through the router uh, give you direct access into that Raspberry Pi serving as the web server. Okay. Now I haven't actually done this yet. These are points that I've been checking on and um, researching. Okay. And, and then the other thing is, is site. Okay. So anyway, and then I found out that it does cost a little, but it's relatively negligible to get a static IP address assigned for your for your router okay and um but then i was also then looking well are, are there any alternatives to that in other words you know i'm kind of negligent I, I'm, I'm a little nervous about signing up for something like that if i'm really not going to be actively using it so i'm trying to find some cheaper alternatives to all this so what i found out that Aside from the static IP address, you could go down the route of utilizing dynamic 
a dynamic DNS service as far as on the client side. All right, and so that's kind of where I'm at with all this. I think I've, I've, found, I've found several. There, in fact, there's lots of free options for that type of client side service. And I suspect that, that that's kind of what I'm going on here is that I suspect that, um, uh, that, that I'll be able to find a solution in utilizing the Raspberry Pi as a web server and uh, be able to be, uh, have, the, have the web page externally uh, usable uh, as, a, as, a re, as a remote client that would, uh, that would, that would make this work. But I, like I say, I don't have any. I don't have any. I don't have any proof of the pudding yet on any of this. I'm just kind of telling you what it is I've been looking at. Donna, what uh, programming language do you plan to do the web server in? Uh, well, let's see. So basically, I, I've, I found some instructable, uh, or an article projects online where all that's kind of done for me. Uh, by that, I mean that there's. Uh, you were going to set up WordPress and work with, and play with some plugins or something, right? Right, but I this is this this is a this is a slightly different solution. Uh, I could I could go down that route as well, and that would be a good backup uh, if this other doesn't work out. Um, and uh, but yeah, I, th this is this is different. This is uh, use, utilizing, from what I can tell, Murray, there's, there's some canned solutions that are out there. In fact, there's lots of solutions that are out there uh, demonstrating the use of a Raspberry Pi as a web server. And, uh, and they're, you know, if they're basically pre-compiled, e downloadable onto your SD card, plug and play solutions. Okay, so, um, you, so in terms of your interest in having, let's say, a Python solution, you probably wouldn't want to go down that road. Well, I'm not, I'm not proficient uh, in Python at this point. That is part of as something that I want to uh, delve into uh, as a you know, longer range uh, learning opportunity. But no, I am not a, I am not a pro Python programmer. I'm C and C++ primarily. Okay, I, the only thing I can offer is that, um, as many of you know, I've got a Python operating system that I call ROS. It's my ROS, not anybody else's. And it's on GitHub. And currently, I haven't used um, the web server on my robot for well over a year. So the GitHub repository doesn't have any of my earlier code. But if anybody wants, and they can put your hand up right now, I can repost the Flask server. Flask is a Python-based web server. And um, what, I, what you do is you create a CSS file, an index HTML file, and then you run basically a single file that only has maybe 10 lines of code, and it pops up a Flask server that points at your index file. And then when you hit, I think it's port 80 on your Pi, and that's even configurable, you get a web server. And, and then, so you don't have to do a lot of programming. And I think actually, if I remember right, my Flask implementation um, is getting called by my robot operating system. But I think you could almost command line the thing and just have a main in your, in your Python program and you just call it. It would fire up the web server and you get a web server. I was using this for piping video from my robot onto the web server so you could hit the web server and see the video on the, on the Raspberry Pi, but you could use it for anything. And anybody mm -hmm. wants, mm -hmm. um, put your hand up, I'll repost it. I'd be interested in seeing how you did the video, just to have another data point there. Okay, I'll, it'll take a little bit of time, but I've got the I've got the archive of the files, so I'll go ahead and, and maybe I can even make it into a, a standalone solution, because it's just like I said, it's an index file, a CSS for some style sheet, which just makes a black screen, I think, and then you just have to populate the index, the HTML file, with what you want it to show up with. I, I know my I would be interested in seeing that, Murray. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and in the next couple of days, see if I can get time to do that. And then I'll post to the mailing list um, the result then. It's good to have multiple solutions. Can I interrupt with a question for Carl? Were you going to demonstrate your phase two today? Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I can do it anytime. Okay, because I, I've been working on a black project. I didn't want to step on your stuff, but it, it kind of steps into what they were talking about. 
So we've got lots of solutions here. Yeah, no, and, and we can't we can't be as sad for having lots of solutions. So I, I want to give one, how about, um, if I can give Donna one feedback and then maybe we see what Doug has to demo. So the, the thing, Donna, you were talking about getting static IP and setting up port forwarding and, you know, that might be nice if you're going to move your house with you every time you want to demo your robot, but that's not very portable as an approach. So um, okay. I think I think if you uh, the the way that I've seen that seems to work pretty well for something like that is I put it in the chat here. It's called NG Rock, and I'm I don't remember if you were on the on this call the last I, couple of weeks or so, but yeah, we had, we had the NG Rock and Dyn DNS discussion, and what NG Rock will do is you load the client on your Raspberry Pi, and it connects up to the NG Rock in the cloud, and it opens a secure tunnel. So then you can, it, what you can do is um, you can use a temporary one for free, a temporary URL on the open internet, or for like seven bucks a month, you can rent your own logical name, your own logical URL that's always yours. And then you just log into NG Rock and you say, well, today, um, you know, this is my logical URL. And then, and then you, 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 uh, you, the client's on your robot, talks to NG Rock, so you just log into the like Donna's robot at ngrock.io and and zoom ngrock puts the secure pipe down to your robot wherever it is through this client. You don't have to do static IP. You don't have to do port forwarding on the router. You don't have to talk to Comcast because I don't know about you, but I don't want to talk to anybody like that. Oh, boy. <laughs> and and this way you can take your robot anywhere you want to go and. Uh, you just hook it up to whatever Wi-Fi you're on, and as long as they're not doing any crazy nonsense on deep packet inspection and shutting ports down and stuff, it, sh it should let the tunnel through, and it'll just run. Okay, so this is, this would be an SSH tunnel, or or what yeah, what is this think, uh, tunnel that you're referring to? I think um, it's a it's a tunnel that the NG Rock client from the Raspberry Pi to the NG Rock IO website sets up, and it. I think it says SSL under the cover. Yeah, but I, think secure a, pipe. I think there's an HTTPS app connection going on there. So it's yeah. for you. It's not done. It's not. Uh, it's not something. I think you could probably dig under the covers and and for you. It's been several years since I've dealt with this. But NG Rock is really cool. It will even let you do certificates. So if you want to bank something into an HTTPS stuff local to your box and not have all those warnings, you can just install your own certificate there and do those things. It's pretty cool. Oh, neat. Okay. It's, it's it's meant for issues just like this. Yes. Uh, and it'll save you a lot of work, I think. If, if you okay. Want to All right. Okay. And so then, how does um, let's see. So you were talking about that basically I would be renting my own URL through NG Rock. I I can understand that. But <clears throat> uh, to um, w would I also then would it, uh, one option then would be to get my own domain name if I chose to go that way, uh, like through namecheap dot, uh, dot com, do a, in other words, utilize the domain registrar, get my own dot com, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, dot IO, and then could I directly hook that domain name in on the NG rock side to yeah. utilize so, that instead of the... Instead if I've understood, that's how it goes uh, at the paid okay. level. At the free level, level oh, yeah. the free stuff, you're gonna get some cryptic name that I changes see. every time. But you know, if you pay money, you, okay. you get more options. Oh, I see. Okay. And, and basically, what is their uh, payment structure? I mean, what kind of paid plans do they have? Oh, you have to check it. I, okay. Like I said, oh, I that's that, that's that's fine. I I, so I, I can five, I can check five that bucks out. Five a month or sixty billed annually, and that gives you a custom subdomain, reserve subdomain. Three uh, reserved domains, one online tunnel, pro eight tunnels, one online tunnel, sixty okay. connections per minute. So I mean, and then you get oh, to the that, higher that, levels, and you can do the the white labeled addresses and wildcard domains, and I don't know. Okay. Well, you can you can also kind of get your own. You know, of course, this is the Microsoft MVP coming out in me, and Azure websites. If you just sign up for the Azure account with a zero dollar limit, meaning don't pay, you gotta give them a credit card, but it sets down to a zero dollar limit so you never pay for anything. You get 10 Azure websites for free. This, of course, they're shared, 
and there have some limitations to them, but they may do everything you care about doing if you want to do them. And yes, you can run them in Linux if you want, or you can run them in ASP.NET if you want, all those sorts of things. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's free. Well, depending on- Donna, you want to do it on the Pi itself, right? You said. Yeah. If you want to do uh, it on yeah. the Pi itself, yeah. that's a different story. I'm just offering you another low cost, uh, or almost free solution, but you won't be able to get your own domain name unless you pay, you know, go up a standard level. Right, sure. Yeah. Okay. It'll be something like my cool website dot my cool website dot azure websites dot com is what it'll be. Right, about. right. Yep. No. Okay. One more comment and it kind of ties in with Mary Murray's question about programming language. I mean you, you certainly don't have to create a web server from scratch, but but you know, if you pick, if you install Apache on your Pi or Light TTP or Nginx, I mean those are the three most popular. Or even if you go the route that, that, that Murray was talking about, okay, so one way or the other, you get the web server. But unless you go a route like Murray was talking about, or you, you, you couple the web server with something else, what you're going to get is static static pages getting delivered, right? Apache, right, running on the Pi, what is it going to do? Well, it's going to serve up static pages. So programming is going to come into the picture one way or the other if you want to do something interesting, right? If you want, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you want the page to be non-static, if you want to be able to click on the button and have that result in the robot moving, mm -hmm. there's going to be some code somewhere. And there are different oh, sure. half a dozen ways to do that. But I think that's what you want to ask yourself, okay, mm -hmm. you said you don't do Python. That's fine because there are other ways to do that, to connect a web server to some logic somewhere, and that can be written in C, C++, or whatever you're comfortable in, and there are ways by which your logic can talk to the web server. So the keyword there is, you know, CGI or fast CGI, and there's some other keywords that escape me right, right now, but there's some standards by which the web server will talk to your program that in turn then moves the robot, right? So something like that has to happen Otherwise, sure. all you're going to have yeah. is a static page. That's right. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I understand that. Yeah. I suspect that uh, PHP is one of those candidates that you're referring to. Right. Um, is a, a good option. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and, okay. That, yeah. And, and actually, Chris, it's a good point that um, if you're this whole idea of tying your code to your robot, somehow getting the data off the robot to the web page is going to require some kind of code somewhere. But if it's not going to be Python code doing that, which is in my case it was, uh, the Flask server is a Python server. But if you're not actually doing your coding in Python, then probably from my experience and yours as well is Nginx, that's N-G-I-N-X, Nginx, is an extremely easy to use web server. It's, it, you don't do any coding at all. It just gives you static web pages, but then you can populate that with you know, hooks and things like that into your own code. But if you're not doing it in Python, I would say don't use Flask. I'm only doing it in Flask because my code is in Python. I would say probably Nginx is a lot easier to use than Flask. Even. That's uh, N-T-N-E-X? No, right? it's like their Nginx is basically a play on, on the way of spelling. It's Nginx. So it's, well, there you go. N oh, N -G -I -N -X. N-G. Yeah, okay. N-G-I-N-X. Okay. And that N basically okay. run on any Linux box like a Raspberry Pi, and you install it and just run it and you get a web server. It's extremely easy. And it's used like all the way into production systems. It, it, it scales and everything. It's powerful and easy yeah, to I've, use. I've, I've used that on uh, on companies. Uh, there's a, the last time I used it was on a hedge firm and they, uh, they advertise they're doing $380 billion worth of assets and they run all their crap through Nginx and a series of those Nginx servers to maintain connectivity and all that kind of stuff. So it is, it is industrial grade. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, okay. but also okay. extremely easy to set up. It's, yeah, it is easy to set up. Easy to, yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So basically, that was. Uh, thanks, Carl, for the uh, hint about about that other solution, NG Rock. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, the only other uh, contribution I was going to make on this project was more on the robot side itself. Um, again, looking at the controller solution being a Raspberry Pi. Um, what I have uh, found out so far is that uh, piece of software 
a library called M M J P G uh, Streamer is a good video uh, solution that can uh, pipe your uh, video frames from your uh, onboard robot camera over to be uh, piped over to your web page for live viewing. So I did find that particular library, okay? Uh, and then also, well, anyway, okay, yeah, that, that that's that's what I wanted to comment on for the specific tool. Um, so anyway, so that so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I can see now that I need to revamp my uh, intended solution a bit, but uh, I appreciate the feedback. Um, so anyway, that, that's what I've been doing uh, regarding the, the platform. I don't have any proof of concept yet, but uh, I uh, this is a, a brand new learning area for me. So I kind of had to uh, start in kind of a building block style to really understand the, the direction that I wanted to go. So yes, I think we're all there. Yep. <laughs> Cool, cool. So thank you. So uh, Doug, what, uh, what what did you have then? Okay, so I'm going to turn my screen to my pie screen, and I think I hope you can see it at this point. Little small. Yeah, probably so. But can you see this here? Yeah. So that's my pie camera, and you see my hand here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then my hand in the screen there. Let me know how good the response is, because when I pick it up, I see it happening instantly on that screen. Is that what you oh, see? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's because you're seeing my local thing. But let's see about sharing the screen here. If I can remember how to do it. I thought there was a share screen option on here. Been too long. I, I think you want to. I think you want to look for present now, uh, Doug. That's yeah, down on the lower right of the uh, of the meet screen. Yeah. Present now. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. I was looking at the dots. I'm gonna do my whole screen and share this screen. Come on, you can do it. There we go. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing my screen now. Yep. Yeah. And what you see here is BNC Viewer, which is also looking at that Pi screen over there. Now this is through the internet, semi real time. And I doubt if you can see my hand at this point. Well, so we're, we're presenting, we're seeing what you're presenting, which is your desktop with all kinds of stuff going on. Right. But uh, I'm trying to decide, I'm getting like a quarter of a second response on this picking up my hand. I'm Across gonna, the internet. Right. So no, I'm going to say- a, Are you going, are you using the, the service by VNC to truly go across the internet or are you free, just on your local free, network? Free service through VNC, through the internet. We'll get to those details in a minute. What I want to show right now is I'm going to say up in just a minute, and then I'm going to pick my hand up. Uh, like a quarter of a second, right? Yeah. Man. So what I'm going to quit presenting now because the point I was going to make, stop presenting, is that for each email address as a developer, a home developer, you can have five free connections over the cloud at no cost to your robot or five different robots. So what you see is a very quick video response. You put up a, a program on the computer screen, which I'm, I haven't got one to show right now, but I've been working with T Kenter, which is the built-in GUI for Python on the Raspberry. You can put buttons on there, sort of like what Chris was showing the other day, go left, go right, do whatever. So you can look at the B and C over to the Pi, look at that screen, click those buttons and see that real time or almost real time 
camera of what's going on and then attach a Zoom camera to it to be your video conferencing. I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. I wasn't really ready to show today because I hadn't got anything other than I can pick my hand up and show you how good the video response is. Uh, uh, Doug, could you, yes. um, at this point, I know that things aren't fully, obviously things aren't fully fleshed out for your solution there yet. And hold, you hold probably have- Hold on. Okay. So Doug, did you do port forwarding through a router or something? So I'm, I'm back. No port okay. forwarding, no, no no odd things. It's just free. It's there. You have to sign up on their service. Okay. Okay. For the so, viewer. And you have to trust them that they're not going to connect to your computer while, you know, <laughs> in your yeah. absence. You, you turn the Pi on when you want to use it. You turn the Pi off when you don't want to use it. Okay. So, anyway, Doug, what I was going to ask you, could you put together some kind of a summary document? Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, you just, you know, verbally went through these right. tools and, and, and techniques. So it would yeah. really help uh, someone like myself if you could document this a little bit. Right. And, I was planning on doing that next week, but I jumped in this week because you were talking about working on a similar thing. And I'm thinking, this seems better. I was trying to keep you from having to waste your time on that other. <laughs> I'm, Otherwise, I'm doing I didn't it better. On, I didn't want to step on what Carl was going to show, which I was real interested to see. And, and I think his solution with that thing that was on Amazon was a good solution too, but I think that had a cost. So exactly what service, can you just summarize where you went to sign up for that? Because I have other use cases, not so much robot related, but remotely connecting the stuff. So which service did you end up getting there for free? Uh, RealVNC.com is the, right. the place. And right, what I'm I there. I Googled VNC server which they didn't no, no, really I, I know real VNC. I, I'm on their website. I'm just yeah. which product or service did you get? Because it's not immediately obvious which what to do to get it for free. Yeah, that was what I found too. And so what I did with Google VNC server, let me hold on a second. Let me get out of this. But it's I, I think it's a, what I thought. It's installed by default on Raspberry Pi. A lot of yeah, the Raspberry but not, Pi. Not to do it across the internet, right? So you have to do you need an account with real in VNC to actually go over the cloud. To do it locally, which I do every day, yeah, it's all installed out of the box. But if you want to go, you know, over the cloud, then you need to jump through some extra hoops there with an account of some sort, right? Yeah, but that it's, a, it's true. A free for Raspberry Pi it's a free. So no, 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 let me make it a point here is there's the viewer and then there's the server. Right. The viewer is what gets you the control of the other robot. Raspberry Pi has the server on there, which means I can be. Right. So you have to you have to get the VNC server. And I'm sorry, I'm I wish I had gotten ready. No, for I got the, I got all that. I got fixing, all of that. It's fixing just... to put uh, something in the chat here. I just still don't know, but just being on their website, all I get the option is it says buy now or 30 day free trial, right? I, I don't see anything else except for buy or 30 day free. Right. So I just put a link in the chat to the download page for the VNC server or viewer rather. And that's when you start to do that, then you have to log in and, and create an account on, on the the VNC site. And I, I'm making up a document that I was going to have ready for next week and I'll explain all of this in pretty good detail. Unfortunately, I didn't. See, I because I'm using the viewer every day. It's just that I don't use any accounts. So, so you're saying you just go ahead and create an account and then you get the functionality over the cloud. Uh, you have to have the account to, to do the functionality over the cloud. Let me pop over oh. here again, real quick. And, and the account is free, is what you're saying? Yeah. The, I'm not sure if you're seeing my screen. And, and, Are you seeing me they'll on let my you screen? Like, they'll let you do a, a free directory lookup for up to five Raspberry Pis, I think. Some, something like right. that. Right. See this See this thing I brought up on my screen? Mm -hmm. yep. That's the viewer. And this is my Raspberry Pi. And this is a, another computer I had. You can have five computers. 
this viewer is not on the Pi. It's something you download on your computer. In yep. order to log in to this computer, see, I'm logged in as me, you have to create an account on the real BNC site. And and I, I wish I hadn't jumped into this because it'll be so much more plain after I show you the step-by-step -step document of how to do that. But it, it's exceptionally easy. And with the free account, you also can connect to other computers over the cloud or only to the Pi over the cloud? Any computer running the VNC server, so, Pi happens to have it built in, but you can download it on Mac, Linux, Windows, Pi, everything basically. And it's free. Up to five computers per email address. And that, that per email address is really, I think you know you can kind of cheat. Like I've got 10 addresses, I can really go to Crown, but I don't know if they'd get mad at you about that. I think there's probably some karma involved with that. But, but the point I was leading up to with that is that for the DPRG telepresence robot system, we might have four robots at our makerspace where we're at. So each robot can have its own email address and therefore can be controlled by lots of people. There may be, I haven't determined it yet, but there may be a, a maximum to the number of people that can at the same time be viewing the same robot. There certainly would be a problem like Carl said in his email as everybody was pushing on the, the movement buttons. So it would be cleaner to have different people on different robots. Any other questions? I couldn't hardly sleep last night. I was pretty excited about what a clean solution this was. <laughs> it does a nice job of the video, doesn't it? The thing that it gets does. me is that was the cleanest thing. Is that it's those that they're able to push screen. low latency video, high quality, low latency video across right. the cloud. VNC's so already done. done all that work. So that's, that's great. And it's free. And yeah. that's even better. And and I know how to put buttons on the screen so I can click the buttons and make something happen. So that's just like the next step. And then it's like, okay, we're, we're working here. Yeah, cool. it, it, if you go on the uh, real VNC and you go to their Raspberry Pi, then it talks about this, uh, control your Raspberry Pi from anywhere for the connection for free with personal use up to five devices. Right. And and I forget exactly where I saw the, the the signing on, but I've got it written down here somewhere. And I will get it I will get it for you all all in a nice neat document for next Tuesday. Well, cool. I mean now that you you mentioned it, I, I just never bothered creating an account. It just but I just did so okay. I need to try yeah. that out. Yeah, I hadn't really bothered it either until a couple of weeks ago we were talking about all of this when I was getting ready to go to Minnesota. And one of my people at work had started controlling some of our pies that we just installed using this method. And and I thought, well, we should be able to do that too. But I it took me until yesterday to prove that the video was really good. Because I had to hook up my Pi with the camera and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm pretty excited about the low latency video. That should be a drivable robot. Yeah, but is it uh, strictly for uh, with the Pi or is it can be any? No. We can use it for the Pi because I doubt if it would work in something like uh, Arduino because it's got to be at least Linux or Windows or Mac or something. Yeah. But, but, uh, the Pi is what I'm using for my robot, and so I expect that the Pi will be a controller for a lot of robots. Is why I mentioned the Pi itself. But if you had, like, uh, Harold's got that uh, Panda, Panda's running Windows 10, it can run VNC. So and it that does. would be the thing. And it does, by the way. <laughs> so VNC is everywhere, and they've done all the work to make the video work good. And they're saying you can have it for free for five remote robots. And I'm thinking, boy, that's really nice of them. <laughs> so your concept then consists of running some user interface sort of on the graphical, you know, surface provided by the Pi and then directly interacting with that? Yes. So, so no no you... web no web technology involved here anywhere basically. That's true. The only web technology is basically the VNC part of it, which is all built in. 
and then you have to uh, add in something like Skype or Zoom from the teleconferencing part. But the driving of the robot should be very straightforward. I mean, for interactive, yes, for interactive, I suppose, yeah. And I hope I don't lose you. I keep hearing transformers blowing out there. At some point, I may just go offline. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Cool. Well, that's a neat, neat approach. So we got so many options. Um, okay. Should we take that as a segue to uh, show you what I've got? Yes. All right. I'm tapping so, it <laughs> so still, nobody's nobody's created a login to drive this robot. Just, um, too much paperwork. <laughs> uh, you expect me to let unauthorized people drive it? <laughs> Email and a password. Create an account. All right. I did this the other night with my uh, with my with my family, and and uh, I had a daughter in San Diego and a daughter in Chicago, and they were both driving it around the house, running it into things. So, Where was the link for it? Uh, I put it in the email, so uh, oh, I don't see that. Well, it's it went to the, a kind of a smaller group. So, Jack, oh, I'll send it to you here. Um, does anybody else want it? I didn't want to put it on the um, on the public chat, but and and what what am I creating here. an account on here? On I'll, what, what I'll put it in the public chat, so whoever wants to sign in can do it. It's in the public chat now. So what is this cloudfront.net business? What is okay. that? So this is, okay, so as a part of the AWS part two tutorial that Donna found, um, you basically use AWS Cog Cognito services to manage it. It's an identity server. So um, just, I mean, use whatever email, but pick a unique password. I don't think I can see it, but it's you're basically creating an account on a web server that I set up on my infrastructure for for this example. And don't forget the last four digits of your social and your bank account now. That's right. With the current balance would be very helpful. And I think <laughs> I think Mr. Chris has already signed up here, so all right. Oh. So um so that means as soon as I turn on the server here, let me see. And well, you need to know your pet's name, your wife's name, where were you born, and your first dog's name, or your first pet's name, so they can really, you know, so they really have all the good stuff. That's right, all the uh, all the important security things. Okay, so I'm going to hit the go, and then we'll see what happens. So. Um, it's initializing right now, and then when the yellow, the yellow light comes on, okay, so whoever's logged in should be able to drive it. Yeah. All right, I'm pushing the button. Okay. Carl, I'm kind of waiting until the lights go off in your house right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good. All right, so Chris, you can, you can drive it around now. So um, now to steer it. Should I turn the video on? Well, yeah, so you're the first person and it's going to be that really laggy video. So here's what, uh, here's what it looks, well, where's my, screen? okay, yeah. So this is what we're, uh, this is what we got right now. This is my 2016 Club Robot. So it's got the Arduino Omega, Arduino Omega down here. It's got the Raspberry Pi here, and then it's got my iPhone on top. And the iPhone is, um, if you look around in the uh, screen, it's logged in using Google Meet. So I think the iPhone is going to give you more real-time video. This is the camera on the Raspberry Pi that's going to have like a two-second lag to the web page. But if you, Chris, hit the go button, like forward or around or something, and let's see if the wheels turn. It should turn. Yep. So every time you hit the button, you get an impulse to go. Okay, so do I, do, I, do I press and hold the button or just press and release and it'll go a foot? Yep. Every tap moves it a bit. Okay. Every tap moves it a bit. So you can get a feel for how totally non-zippy it is. Can multiple people view video at the same time? Uh, only, only one video at a time, I'm uh, afraid. Okay. And how do I get that iPhone that iPhone view? I guess I need to change my layout and find it. Um, yeah, so 
Here, I'll put, I'll, uh, I'll share my screen with what the robot's seeing now. So now, okay, so you're showing? looking at- I think someone right else top. is also controlling it. I'm sure I'm not the only one. I wouldn't be surprised. I'm innocent. Okay. <laughs> That's me, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're a few feet away from hitting anything. That's the junk drawer. Okay. All right. Now I now I see your 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 real time. Let me let me compare the the. Oh yeah, definitely a difference in. Yeah. I just aim it down a little bit more. So you can you can hit the button a bunch of times in a row, and it'll just do it back to back. Oh okay. Yeah. And if you might want to turn left before you hit the. Here we go. Somebody turn left. Oh there, you are. oh, there we are. Okay, that's good. Then you go forward. So, I mean, I'm guessing that it's pretty responsive with the, uh, what do you think? There's like a 10 second delay, I'd say. I don't know, maybe, maybe less. Yeah. 10 seconds is a long time. Actually, three seconds. <laughs> From when you hit the button to when it moves? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, three seconds. Uh, I think it's, let me, I'm going to pull up my stopwatch here. Or to here. when I see it move anyway. Yeah, if you look at the, if, if you look at the, well, which camera are you looking at? I'm looking at the uh, online camera, not the Zoom camera. Okay, yeah, the online camera is definitely oh, super slow. I'm yeah, the online, it. That's, that, that's the just, two second. that's unusable, but the Zoom yeah. ones will be pretty fast. Let me time the zoom oh, yeah, camera. Just stop the I'll movement stop. for a second. I'm just going to do a quick time test. OK, it's like a second and a half from clicking the button until the zoom camera moves. Huh. And then I'm going to let me look at the other camera real quick. Yeah, that was three seconds, yeah. All right. Well, anyhow, not a very exciting demo, but it... No, that was cool. It, it was, was exciting. Cool. Yeah. I mean, that's a telepresence robot. You know, quick and dirty. But it... Oh, there's it, some stairs. Let's go there. Let's go to the stairs. Yeah, let's... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, send it down the stairs and watch what happens. <laughs> this has this affinity for check stairs. Yeah. <laughs> I like to live on the edge. Okay, and then you can see the pile of stuff that has to go out to the trash, but all right. So the, the there was some um, some findings that I got from this is that for one, it, it just can be fun to just drive around and explore. But the, the insight that I had from this exercise was that um, and there I am, yeah, my desk, hi, hi. So basically, uh, you better turn right a little bit before it hits the door. Right. Basically, for one of these sessions where we have like a whole bunch of people, and to, to Dave Anderson's point, one person is more or less talking at a time, having a robot or a swarm of robots that can mingle around in the, cloud, in the crowd, I don't know if that makes a whole lot of sense. So it seems to me that that this kind of thing where it can drive around and move and interact it makes more sense if you've got like a a mingle of people in person and the robot is itself kind of like another person thing mingling around agree does that make sense yeah mm -hmm. well carl if you think about it this way that if you consider that a telepresence robot where you can see through the camera and you can control the robot if you add to that a relative amount of autonomy, in other words, bumpers and some infrared sensors so that the robot doesn't bump into things, you've basically done what they've done on Mars. That's kind of the same thing, that it, you can direct the robot with some tasks, but the robot also interacts with its environment and doesn't bump into things. And, and, you can, and the only thing you'd have to do to make it truly like Mars, apart from the science and all that, is to be able to say, from where the robot is now, I want you to go to a certain location or to go a certain pattern or, or perform some kind of function. And the robot can go off and do that 
for maybe 10 or 15 seconds or whatever, and then report back on what it did. That's basically what the science of Mars is, is that you send it off on a task and it can survive for a while and then comes back and stops and says, okay, I did, okay I've done that, here's my data. And that's telepresence, basically. Basically, yep. And that's what I was thinking. That's what I think you could make this a, a cool project. Hmm. Yeah, to figure cool. out how to do this and make it work better. And not are. drive down the stairs. And not drive down the stairs. So then we get into the cool programming aspect of it to make all that work. Yeah. Right. Yeah, some combination of uh, of of uh, mechanics, but then a, an awful lot of software. In a, Depending on in a what defined API so that different robots can use the same API. Yes. And that's where somebody found, no, uh, I think it was uh, Doug P. He found another project from Make Magazine or something. And, and they had, uh, you know, this has been done so many times before, right? So the project that Doug found uh, was uh, maybe a little more aligned to what it was in my mind when, when I proposed this versus this AWS example. And, and that was that, uh, they have, set, they have some kind of service, looks like, set up where you can register your robot to the service, then other people can register to the service. And and basically, that's the way it, it seems to make sense to me, that if we have yeah. the API well designed, then anybody could register their robot with the service. And then anybody who wants to drive it could request permission to drive the ro a, a given robot around. And then the service would be a kind of like mixing pot where anybody could connect any other robot as long as they had the rights to do so. Doesn't seem to be active though. I mean, all the code is there. Maybe there are some things that can be learned from that, but the main service, I think let's robot.tv was the website. I went there, it didn't respond, at least not at the time when I tried it. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, right? Because it, um, if it's not active, I think you're right. I think there's going to be lessons to pull from this stuff, but we're in a different year now than when a lot of these other ones were done, and we have our own kind of interests and desirements. So, uh, and, and we want to learn, right? So why not why not define what we want to do? And yeah. Plus, they were probably trying to figure out a way to monetize it. We aren't. That yeah. makes a big difference. That makes a real big difference. A yeah, real big difference, yeah. Because, I mean, even last year, I think there was a Kickstarter. Somebody, uh, they had one of these cardboard style projects where you could make a cardboard <laughs> telepresence robot. <laughs> oh, but then you'd have to pay like 10 bucks a month license fee to keep it registered or something. No, I don't think so. <laughs> but it was pretty cool. I, I, apparently at their heyday, you know, they in the Make magazine they showed. They probably I saw a picture of about twelve robots that they had, and you know, some of them had ping pong ball cannons on them and other things. And essentially, you would just log in to a robot, take it over, and drive it around in yeah. the environment of the person's house. So it was kind of it was interesting, and I figured there might be something in there. I'm sure they had to overcome some of the same problems. No doubt. Just well, goes to show you, want a new idea, read an old book. Mm -hmm. Think of any conference or show that you might want to go to, but you don't want to pay a, an expensive ticket for a flight and hotel, you know? I mean, you could buzz around whatever conference you wanted. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I, I don't know. You guys have seen on my web page that we built a a radio control with a camera on it many years ago that used a regular broadcast TV uh, signal and uh, drove it around the building. We'd sit down in the data center and drive it around the building. And the most fun we had was we would uh, worry of the trash cans loose from the wall and then we'd push them down the hallway and push them into the stairwells and push them down the stairs. <laughs> so, and, and then then we would turn around and look to see if anybody saw us and then run away. <laughs> and I recommend this highly. I imagine if you were a bedridden child, uh, you might get many hours of delight. Uh, the other thing, I, I mentioned this before, you know, we didn't, 
we didn't have any way to open doors or open the elevator doors, but we had a, a mount for the camera, which could go up and down and look back and forth. So we could like look both ways before crossing. And so basically the, the robot could nod its head yes and shake its head no. And so if you want to go through a door, you just pulled up to the door and waited and looked around. And finally a human would come up and would say, you know, do you want to go through the door? And you go, yeah, like that. And they would open the door and let us through. They would let us onto the elevator, for example, and uh, which was a little scary because we often lost the TV signal when it was on the, the <laughs> elevator. Wow. And so there's a whole lot of things you can do without another human on the other end. And uh, if you haven't seen, go to my web pages. I think it's right there at the beginning. It shows that uh, um, weighing a trash can loose. You have to be very careful when you push it down the stairs because you don't want the robot to fall down the stairs. So it requires the <laughs> And careful maneuvering. I have had the rope fall down the stairs, and I can tell you as it tumbles end over end, you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> totally story -winning. You can't tell what's happening at all. It's just this jumble of images. I have so, to say, those are some of the funniest robot videos I've seen. <laughs> yeah, I know I mentioned this before. We always thought the last thing we would ever see would just be a hand. That would just. <laughs> nice. I'll, never, I'll remember uh, at, we have an event here in Dallas called Moon Day. It happens in July, which is a celebration of the moon, moon land, first moon landing. And uh, DPRG often participates as uh, one of the exhibitors. And uh, one year we, uh, we took a turtle bot. So, you know, that's like a, a Roomba with a big stru uh, superstructure on it and cameras and stuff. And we had a sign on it said, come see the robots on both sides. And we had, you know, we actually had a guy in the corner driving it. And nobody could see him because he was way over on the other side of the room. And he would drive that around through the whole exhibit hall and we have somebody walking with them because the kids would have just torn them apart. Uh, and they, it was just incredible the reactions you got from people. I mean, it was, the kids were nuts, you know, and like I said, we had to have a, a guard over it so they didn't just take, take it apart piece by piece. But uh, everybody thought it, everybody thought it was doing it by itself because they couldn't see how it was doing it. And it was, just, it was just really amazing, you know? You know, they would, the guy that I was, when I was walking it around, had my hand in my pocket, you know, just walking around. And the guy said, oh, you got your hand in your pocket. You're controlling it. And I'd pull it out and say, no, it's not me. You know, <laughs> it was just amazing. A lot of, like, not just kids, adults too. So Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Behind the curtain right, exactly. <laughs> On a more autonomous robot note, I, I noticed that I used to take my outdoor robot down to the park here that's a couple of blocks from the house and running around. There's a, I had a GPS waypoint in the middle of the basketball court down there at the, at the park and another one in the middle of my driveway. And so I'd just walk along with it. And often kids would come out and, and talk to me and ask me what was going on. But my observation was, you know, they would say, what's it doing? And I'd explain what was going on. And then I tell them, go, go out there and stand in front of it. Go stand in front of the robot. They go stand in front of the robot, and it would maneuver around them. Now, so they were sitting there watching it, maneuvering around cars and trees and telephone poles and picnic tables, and not particularly impressed. But when they saw that it interacted with them, that they could move and it would move, that's what set it off. That's what got them excited. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that the robot was interactive. Now, if you want to cheat, and have a guy running by remote control over hiding in the bushes, uh, you can generate that same sense of awe, but it seems to me like you're cheating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you are. Uh, one of the things that I that, that also exhibited, we also, the club has a 10-foot robot of Robbie that was put together by Ron Grant, uh, Will, myself, and a couple other people that are not with the club anymore. And uh, the uh, 
So it's it's basically a ten foot robot, and it just has one hand that moves around and does all sorts of stuff, and uh, a couple of twirlies, and it also has an analytics box in it, and it has something that says to the speakers every periodically, like things like "Please stand back from the robot," and a few other. And it's just odd. It just happens whenever the t random timer hot hits it. But every once in a while, a kid would be sneaking up on a robot and it would say, please stand back from the robot. And the kid's eyes would get so big. And it was totally random, random thing, but they would just get, oh, you know, and it was, it, it's an amazing, uh, like Dave was saying, when they think it's interacting with them, it's a whole different ball game. So, but that's cool. I guess you guys have never seen Big Robbie. Uh, a lot of you, but if you do, it's uh, you can look in the, the the video archives. It's in there. If we could only afford one of those Boston Dynamic robots, boy, that would be a show. Yeah, now that, then you would be good. Did you guys see the uh, the video that was out of the gal walking her Boston Dynamics dog down the? So somewhere in Miami or something, she she put one of them on a leash. And was walking it along the sidewalk like a dog. <laughs> the seen police that. said, "The police said, wait a second, oh, wait, ma'am." So, so she had her robot sit, sit. <laughs> Anyhow, it's kind of amusing. Well, I think for sure that that one of us uh, needs to buy one of those things before they go out of business. <laughs> you get an extra fourteen k. That seemed like a volunteer. Ray, Ray are you volunteering? Uh, you know, in in thought and everything else except finance, I would I would do it. But uh, you know, <laughs> the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's that's it. no the pay the, the, the bank account is weak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what does what does Spot go for? Isn't he like ten thousand bucks or something? No, about well, fourteen thousand. I think it is. Fourteen. Yeah. I think something like that. Yeah. That's yeah. a bargain. I thought they were seventy. You okay. know, I, I thought they were seventy too. So, four, I mean, fourteen thousand is still a lot of money. But and and you know, you, we've all seen them doing the dance, and we've all seen them do that reverse kinetic thing where he holds his his front paw or front arm still, and then dances around it, and that thing doesn't move off a point, or at least I can't tell it visually. You know, that's that's just damn impressive. That's all there is. To I just. It. I just looked it up. I was entirely wrong. It's seventy-four thousand five hundred. Oh, so there you oh, go. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I was just on yeah. some website the other day, and um, they sell a whole bunch of kind of industrial-sized robot platforms. You know, like the big wheel ones. You can they carry six hundred pounds, and I for some reason got the idea that it was cheaper than that. But no. Hmm. There's going to be a lot of people. I mean, Boston, right? They pioneered that, right? So. Um, as soon as one person does it, though, and they figure out kind of how it does it, and then they have some other other ideas of what they're doing and and what's going on, there's, there are a lot of people out there that are copying that, right? And they're doing it better. Who knows, right? Well, there there are, Harold, there are actually a couple of companies putting together. The one thing about the spot robot is it's actually industrial. I mean, it's like steel yeah, and stainless steel and all the right materials, and it's yeah. very durable. The ones that are competitors to it are lighter weight quite a lot smaller and probably have smaller motors and less, yeah. you know, less uh, time on, on their batteries and stuff. And those I think are more in like the 10 or $15,000 range, but do all the same things, but they can't like spot can actually carry hardware and stuff like yeah. guns. Yeah. Well, they got, but, uh, they got a call. They, they, that spot. They also got a couple of more models like dogs and big dogs that are literally the size of a truck for, yeah. for doing, you know, military overland stuff. And yeah, those things that somebody pushes them over, they wrap themselves up. I don't know who's going to push them over because that's, you know, it's a pretty good weight. But I guess if a tank runs over it or hits it or something, maybe, I guess. I don't know. Well, there the is that one, there's that one the video of a uh, spot slipping on a banana peel. Yeah. Yeah. The first time the I who had funded a bunch of those to, uh, turned out to be not interested. And I believe it was uh, two reasons. The first one is that those are real loud. Uh, yeah. The, so, you know, in terms of sneaking through the woods and sneaking up on somebody, it's, it's not going to happen. 
And it just turns out that a real-life mule uh, works so much better. It can carry heavy weight. It can fuel itself off the grass as it walks along. And if push comes to shove, you can kill it and eat it. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it, it's, just a, it's just a whole lot more flexible. Uh, and, they, and they're stealthy, and they can handle real steep. You know, the real problem with all of those, and uh, Murray was talking about uh, other manufacturers knocking off the ideas and so forth, and that would all be fine and good if there was actually anything useful for them to do. Yeah. But there really isn't. Nobody's really found anything useful for them to do. They're cool. I'd yeah. love to have them. Uh, but in terms of problem solving, uh, there's almost always a better way. Uh, certainly, a, you know, a, a mule is cheaper and, uh, as I said, easier to feed and maintain. Uh, there's cheaper ways of doing it. So having a knockoff, and uh, I'm sure I'm, I'm just uh, preaching to the choir here, but for those of you whose computer experience goes back into the last century, uh, you may realize, remember that when computers first came home with us, uh, you know, Southwest Techs and the uh, uh, IM, what was it, ISMA? Uh, mm -hmm. the yes. little, yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, you bring your friends over to your house and you say, let me show you my computer. Look, I can run a memory test. And then I can move the code over into this other part of memory and test the, the memory that it was just in. And when I hit return, it comes back and says, okay, isn't that cool? And nobody thought it was cool. But then came VisiCalc. And VisiCalc was the first thing you could show them. And they'd say, oh, I, I'd like to have that. So all of a sudden, there was a reason to do knockoffs. There was something valuable. But I, I don't think any of the robots we're discussing have shown that they have any value other than entertainment and they're yeah. absolutely amazing i had yeah. they are amazing but it's hard to think of a problem that that there's not a better cheaper solution uh, than a robot and i actually i i just had done the search on google for the cost of the spot robot and i just did a search on the cost of a mule and it's one to three thousand dollars <laughs> You can get them at the one SPCA. to three thousand or one thousand to three thousand. No one between. This says, however, most mules are sold between one and three one thousand and three thousand dollars. Yes. Yeah. And you know they both probably do what you want them to do equally well, or well, not do what mule. you want them to do. I don't know. Mules have a reputation, you know. That, well, so do robots. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you're not eating your robot, man. So, you know, that's well, not a. <laughs> I remember back in antiquity when I was at TI and they, they came out with the uh, uh, their computer, the what was it, the, the 994A? Yeah. Yep. And uh, oh, yeah. I remember I was. Uh, writing one time uh, with the one of the executives, and he says, "What are these things really good for?" And I said, "I haven't got a clue." <laughs> <laughs> Video games. Well, my goal for my my home robot that I eventually will build is for it to be as smart as my dog. If it can do that much intelligence, I will be pleased. You, Have you, some behavior. Doug, Doug, you do. You'll be ahead of everybody. <laughs> Doug, you do well, realize that part of heavy bee, honeybee, I would be happy. I think a dog is way, way, way beyond us. I think way so. Beyond us. Could be. Back around the 1990s, IBM had managed to actually, I mean, remember you, how do I put this? The whole world of AI is kind of BS. Anyone who does investigations, you realize that, like, I actually, I, I never finished a PhD program, but I was in the knowledge representation AI world for about four years in England. And the more you know about it, the more you realize it's BS. And so like Elon Musk being afraid of AI just says how stupid he is. Um, <laughs> it's not going to happen. And in the 90s, I think it was IBM or one of the big companies put together a robot that tried to do what you might call true intelligence, like real intelligence, neural based intelligence. And they had this massive system, and they said that it had this. It had the smarts of a garden slug. Yeah. And that was actually accurate. I mean, right. Far smarter than a garden slug. But my point with the dog was that you can train your dog to do a couple of tricks, so you should be able to train your robot to do a couple of tricks, and that's about all they're going to do. 
They're never going to figure out things. You're not trying to do intelligence. You're just saying right. it can back to sensors. No. I'm saying you say you're trying. In the room, look for people, you know, do some activity. That's what I want my robot to do. Monitor hey, this. Greg, if, you, if you watch your dad, dog just pick its way through the backyard or up a slope. Uh, what's going on there is so complicated and so much I know, more I know. Than, what, than what we're able to do right now. Right. And things that seem uh, trivial to us. Uh, I was thinking about this uh, going into work the other day. I jumped out of my car and went across the parking lot, went up the steps and went into the building. And I thought, <clears throat> yeah, I've been working with my mom who's kind of handicapped. And I thought that was so trivial for me. I didn't think about what my legs were doing or what the muscles were doing. I just said, go over there. And it happened, you know. And so I think that there's a tendency to believe that, well, a robot will do the same thing. And uh, I just think that that's – John, you find that funny? The things that are <laughs> trivial for us to do uh, turn out to be really, really hard. Well, and so you can't use uh, whether or not it's trivial for us as an indication of whether or not – let's say if you could get a robot that could pick its way through the backyard uh, by uh, the same way a dog can, I'll be very impressed, even if he can't do, fetch a ball or do anything else. Right. But on the other side, what you're talking about for your August contest is to pick your way around a, a spot and go to certain places and come back. That's a trainable behavior. That's, that's not with just... wheels. I'm talking about the ability to place your foot in the proper position one after another while scampering up a hillside. Right. That's just a really hard problem. That it's is. Really hard. I, I don't think you're going to have a bipedal robot that can handle that for less than a million dollars anytime soon. <laughs> well, dogs have four legs. Right. So they're but, quadruped. Uh, but I wasn't uh, saying that the robot was actually going to be able to do everything the dog could do. I was just thinking sort of like you did, where, you know, what what do I really expect out of this robot? What do You were saying, what do... I just did this thing that was so trivial, but it's not really trivial to program. And and I got to thinking, well, I teach my dog roll over. It's a relatively straightforward activity. So what I expect my robot to be able to do is that I can train it in an activity and then it will be able to do that activity autonomously or upon command. That's that's what I meant by as smart as my dog. Doug, when you say train, it sounds like uh you you're programming some new neural network <laughs> yeah see i was that's not what i meant yeah. by training training yeah. for a robot is writing the program yeah that's right teaching yeah. it so that it learns it but you write a program that says i want to map my house so that's one of the first things the robot's got to do is map the house now the house is going to have walls that aren't moving very often it's going to have doors that can be moved to exit to another room it's going to have obstructions like chairs and things that will move not permanently placed so this is a pretty non-trivial activity but with the robot able to autonomously move around and not bump into things it can constantly be updating its map with where's the movable objects and you can say okay i've mapped five rooms in this house i give each of those rooms a name and i should be able to say robot go to the living room and it does it it's not a trivial activity, but it's a doable activity. It's a trainable activity. And that's my goal is to be able to get to that point. And I think, oh, really have something here. Look, I can tell my robot with my voice to go to the living room and it does it. <laughs> well, I, I, think I, I have to say, Doug, I, I think the goal is admirable. And I have a thought before that, uh, that what I'd really like to have in an ultimate world uh, would be a robot uh, that's kind of like a a sheepdog or a border collie. It's autonomous in the sense that, uh, but it's also under control. So you give it large scale commands and it figures out how to do the little pieces. Right. Uh, uh, rather than other types of paradigms. But as I said, right now, if I had a, a robot that was as smart as a honeybee, uh, I would be quite impressed. Right. And, uh, and I think we're a long way from the honeybee and maybe, and maybe long, long way from, from the dog. I don't think well, I'll be think, demonstrating my robot anytime soon. <laughs> well, this kind of does represent the long. split that happened in the robotics and artificial intelligence world that Rodney Brooks at MIT and his robot lab 
kind of split off with behavior based robots versus the the heavy AI style robots where you were trying to map environments and do really complicated on you know computer based ontological representations of reality with like is this a pair of shoes on the floor that might move a chair might move but the wall won't that kind of representation of reality is big computer and it's kind of largely failed it, it, it's, it's some successes but it's but on the other hand rodney's point was with behavior-based robots which is what david and i are trying to do and others is that yeah, you don't have to really map reality or have representations of dogs and chairs and things in order to have a robot perform certain tasks and i think that you can do that you can do bbs on an arduino and david's shown you can do it on a small 8-bit or 16-bit microcontroller mm -hmm. whereas the other side of it, like machine learning and big computers right i may have overstated what my attempt was just because i chose the wrong words but no, what you're okay. saying is really what i'm trying to accomplish my goal is to make your based robotics okay hey i'd like to change the subject since we have donna here donna uh you got a robotron i think it's called robotron that's uh, yeah, ro Robothon, yeah. Robothon. Robothon. Yeah. Okay, two years ago, two or three years ago, they introduced, you know, the classic robot problem. The robot, you're sitting there watching television, and the robot goes into the kitchen, opens the the, the refrigerator oh, door, and gets you a Yeah, you're, talk, you're talking about the pop can challenge. Right. Mm -hmm. What, how, how many competitors did they typically have? Well, and what did yeah. they did they ever accomplish the task? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Doug. Uh, a good point uh, for discussion. So it's been a relatively popular uh, contest since its inception. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's maybe about three years old, uh, something like that. And uh, it's it it's it's been popular with. Um, with the higher, you know, higher skilled and roboticists, yeah. something in the line with a Robo Magellan yeah. uh, uh, builder, and it, but it's it's just like I mean, I'll, I'm talking about SRS people, okay? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, Or I mean, or people that have had from out of the area who have tried to compete in either the Robo Magellan or the Pop Can Challenge contest. Yeah. Um, in both cases, uh, the, in neither contest has really been solved to the intention of the or the creator of the uh, contest idea. In other yeah. words, the the fridge, uh, what what ended up happening with the pop can challenge uh, is that they ended the creator ended up implementing various levels or mini challenges that the builder could so in other words the idea of you know being able to get to a certain level on yeah. the floor plan uh in making it the robot's way to the fridge to be able to get out that uh can of pop okay yeah. or beer, Donna, you know, wasn't, it, it was. wasn't it also true that uh, from the very beginning they actually got rid of real refrigerators and had little cardboard boxes with easy uh, to open doors so uh, it wasn't actually like a real no. Well, I don't I think never so. saw anybody ac actually open a refrigerator door. The well, only that's just I saw, it. I saw yeah. the little cardboard boxes that were supposed to represent okay. refrigerators, which okay. they could open. Well, the maybe door. that was, maybe that was kind of like a. I really don't know, David, what you saw there uh, or what the source was, but I got a feeling that that was kind of like a mock-up kind of thing, uh, because the actual the reason I say that is that whenever we do run that contest at the Seattle Center uh, it, for a particular year, is that there is an actual mini fridge. It is a real fridge that is used in that space in the floor plan. Is it sitting uh, on the floor or is it up on something? Uh, let's see, it seems to me that it is, it's literally on the floor. There's some space uh, there, you know, for the door to be able to open and close uh, without friction. Uh, being added for the floor surface, but basically it's it's close to the it's at the floor surface. Um, I, I I have never tried. I have not tried as of yet to try and compete in that contest. Mm 
so to be frank. One, so one they they started in uh, essentially in what was the whole arena is sort of like a dog bone. And you start off in one of the ends of the dog bone and you proceed through right. the through the hallway into right. the other dog bone. You go to right. a refrigerator, you open the refrigerator, you reach in and pull in the pop, you close mm -hmm. the close the door, mm -hmm. go back into the other dog bone through the hall. Right. Right. And, put it, and put the bottle on on a table uh, on a table that's right that's the right. yes that is the overall goal of the contest okay. yes right. um and you know like i say there's there's been little mini contests or little mini challenges that have been uh popular uh since the overall challenge has been you know too much uh you know and that, and that could be you know virtually once that we get what I'm hoping over time that the SRS and DPRG can cooperative, cooperatively develop a virtual contest entry uh, model, you know, with you guys, with your higher end smarts and, and expertise in a lot of these higher end robot designs. I think it would be great and cool if virtually you guys could compete uh in a you know in in these contests like the pop can challenge because you guys may bring a whole new level of sophistication that the srs group has not seen yet i mean based on what i know of you guys with the caliber of of expertise uh that that's within this group uh i think that entries like that at our higher end uh contest uh is is very doable i know you guys are smiling about that but uh, Clearly not battery, talking about me. <laughs> battery will get you nowhere. <laughs> I currently do not have a robot that will roll down the the floor. Getting back to David's first challenge is make the thing move. I haven't got one yet, <laughs> but I have plans. Well, we all, David, we all you, you have robots that could probably push a refrigerator down a set of stairs. <laughs> Uh, but one thing, Doug, as far as the uh, furniture and uh, the placement, you know, in the dog bones for the pop can challenge, one thing that isn't real as far as real type furniture it are the uh, the tables and chairs. Well, some of them. Uh, there's there's like there's at least one couch that's part of the floor plan, and that's one of and and that and the and one of the coffee tables or the coffee table um are are all they're kind of like a blow up you know one of those uh, portable uh kind of designs uh yeah. that, that that were chosen for that and it seems to me that over in the kitchen area that that is a real table real chair that's used in the kitchen area there's a real dog dish that is used i think it's a metal dog dish mm -hmm. But the other, but that, but those other furniture uh, components are, are of a uh, blow up portable. Uh, Do they have, um, is any of that ever on any video, Donna? Uh, no, that's something that I'm currently working with the club since I've started to co-mingle with you guys. <clears throat> I've gotten the idea that we need to, on the SRS side, start uh, creating both promotional videos and actual uh, contest run material, you know, all that kind of stuff. So no, you can learn we a don't... lot from those. You can learn a lot from those. I yeah. know exactly, and you can you can build enthusiasm and um, you, you know. Anyway, yeah. So yeah. I I know that's something that I'm currently working with the guys on. Um, so anyway, I thought Will of Garage or or somebody that was demonstrating Ross robots. There were there were several videos of robots trying to open like full size refrigerator doors and they the whatever mechanism that they'd use to try to grab the handle would get stuck and it would, you know, pull the refrigerator over or just mangle the front of the door or you know, <laughs> there were Yeah, well, well, you remember the, the Dark of Grand Challenge of a few years ago that was supposed to be humanoid robots that can do things like open doors and so forth. And uh all of them had a real hard time opening the doors. And when I viewed the videos, they insisted on showing them at like 10 times real speed. 
because nobody would sit through that, <laughs> you know, that half an hour process of locating a doorknob and trying to grab it and open the door. Yeah, but you also guys. think, if you think about one of those refrigeration re refrigerators, they're about, I'd say they're at least 24 inches high, maybe 30, I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, they got that magnetic seal all the way around. And I can imagine, you know, how much of a robot, you know, we just, re you know, a guy that's 150 to 200 pounds reaches over there and pops that seal just like that. And he doesn't move. You know, he's just his arm moves. But you can imagine if you got a little 10, 10 pound robot on the floor and it reaches up there and grabs and tries to open that door, it, it's still going to happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Huh. You know, they're going to have to have, there's got to be some weight in that robot to be able to pull that back. And, and in general, Doug, that's what the SRS has seen for its entrance in that contest is they have all been weightier uh, competitors. That, yeah, that, they that's have for to sure. be. I mean, I mean, you know, they got to be. Yeah. Unless well, you're competing, unless you're competing in one of those lower end uh, sideline mini challenges that are part yeah. of the whole contest. Yeah. Uh, you know, then you're going to see the, you know, the lower technology, the lower weight. Uh, entrance, but um, um. And of course, for seventy-five thousand dollars, you can buy Spot, and they've got lots of video of the Boston Dynamic robot Spot opening doors, but they're not refrigerator yeah. doors either, which that's a bit yeah. different. But. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's a little bit concerning, and uh, Donna, it's something you might ought to think about. Uh, you know, when I go to somebody's web page that's showing off their robot and all they have is still pictures, I'm always a little bit suspicious because, you know, what they're trying to do is get me to imagine. Well, I can imagine all kinds of things. <laughs> and when they actually show the video of what it's really doing, it's inevitably disappointing. Uh, so, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is if all you want is a video from me of my robot, I got a robot that can, you know, levitate and travel backwards through time, you know. <laughs> yeah, but Dave, you, know, to, you, know, Dave, you know, I can I can have some pretty damn impressive robots if all I'm required to have is a video. Well, D David, you know, you you spoiled us with your balancing robot. I don't re I remember its name. But uh, you know, when I watch balancing robot videos and you know, they're all over the web, they're all pretty lame compared to yours, you know, I mean, that's the just, just, just true. Now all you need is an arm that, that can open up one of the refrigerator doors. That, you have to get uh, an arm that opens up refrigerator doors there. Okay, go ahead. That most people I'm seem intent just to get their robot to balance. That yeah. is, once they got the balance, they were done. And nobody added sensors and tried to make it do anything. Yeah. Uh, and so, I think that's maybe one of the differences. I tried to actually make my robot do something. Do something just, yeah. Um, yeah. And you've worked with it over years. I mean, you've kept improving it. Yeah. Well, and this, well is a, this is a pet peeve of mine. And I guess it goes back to what I was saying about robot pictures, robot sculptures, I think of them. Uh, in my other hobby, uh, let's say, for example, uh, radio control helicopters or radio control airplanes, if you pick up one of their magazines, and read an article. Uh, what the article is about is here's an airplane that can do something really cool. And now here's an article showing you how we did that. But in robot magazines, Servo, Make, any of the ones that have come and go, that's not the kind of articles you get. What you kind of get is here's how I can get my robot to do something and imagine how cool it will be. You never see somebody starting off by saying, here is a cool thing my robot can do now let me show you how I did it. It's always the other way around. You know, once we get all this working, just think of the great things you'll be able to do. And uh, I think that that, well, it doesn't attract me. You know, it yeah. doesn't draw me. You show me a picture of a robot and I can imagine it doing all kinds of things. Uh, as can anybody. Uh, but then when you actually see it operating and you realize it can, it can barely even move, uh, like, for example, the Sony Abio. 
you know, it's a cute little dog. You imagine it behaving like a cute little dog, and then you find out it can't really even walk. Mm-hmm. It doesn't behave like a cute dog. We have a cute dog. I can tell you the difference. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it may also be uh, that uh, what was being referred to earlier, that actually all you need to do is have the right commands. So my mom has this little Boston Terrier, and once you learn how to give it the right commands, it's like, okay, sit there and look bored. Uh, now wander over to the door and look out, but don't scratch to ask to go outside. Now wander over and look at your food dish and then walk back into the living room. You know, as long as you have the right commands, it's really impressive what it can do. So it's just a matter of giving the right commands to the robot. Well, it kind of reminds me, I'm, I'm starting to look into building a rocker bogey robot and of all of the rocker bogey robots I've seen, the vast majority of them, and I'm going to try to demonstrate this, have a wheel and a motor. And the wheel is over here, and the motor is over here. And if you look at these things online, you figure that was actually driving across a landscape. That motor is going to be banging into things. They've never actually enclosed the motor inside the wheel. In fact, I can't even find wheels deep enough to put my motors in. And the only thing I'm saying here is that people like appearances. It's nice to have a good-looking robot that has flashy lights, but the actual requirements... Flashy lights. Yeah, yeah, flashing lights. But the actual requirements on a robot, like being able to drive across a landscape where you've actually got the ability to shield your motors from being banged on by a tree branch, or the ability to actually sense that you've run into something and... Like David's robots, for example, his IMU, if the robot tips over, he can tell. The robot knows it's tipped over because it's actually noticed that it's tilted. But the vast majority of robots don't even have an IMU. You know, the, the kits out there, in fact, some of these ten, fifteen thousand dollar industrial robots are meant to be driven with a laptop. They're they're telepresence robots. They're not autonomous at all. And so part of the appeal for me is trying to have some measure of autonomy. And that's just extremely difficult. That was in the email Dave, David sent in. It was like, it's just too hard. Well, see, that's the advantage we have as experimental robot builders. You know, if we were working for a company doing this, we'd have to pursue something that was guaranteed to be successful. Uh, as experimental robot builders, we can try things that will fail. We and have make the luxury money. of doing that. And make money. <laughs> yeah. So getting back to what you were saying, Murray, about the the rocker bogey, because I've been thinking about that too. If I try to make this August challenge, which is unlikely, because I still don't have any robot moving. <laughs> so that seems like a stretch to me. But I was thinking about that problem with the motors being down on the wheels, because to me, that was a problem, too. And I thought of two potential solutions to that problem. You're welcome to use it if you get something built before me. One would be to have chain-driven wheels where the motor is up in the body, and it, yeah. it chains down to the wheels. So okay. that, that chain is actually in the tube, and you just have the wheels against the tube. That seems like an easy solution, although... I don't know how that chain is really going to be able to work mechanically. The other solution that I came up with was to have gear driven uh, wheels where the motor was up here and it did a gear that sent it down there that did a gear to make the motor work. And that that's another way that you can protect the motor from being in the thing and make it so that it can go through water. Because well, the motor's well, not here. There, there's a third, actually, Doug, and if you go to Actabotics and some of the companies that sell all these hardware parts, the other is actually belt drive. And um, yeah. the belt drives are actually, they, they I think it's Actabotics, I can't remember, but they have the, the, the belts, they've got everything, the belts and, you know, with all the different lengths and all the different belt pulleys and everything, all ready to go. And so, yeah, oh, okay. you certainly could. And if you think about the way a rocker bogey is set up, the you know, you've got that steering mechanism up on top, and then the, right. the wheel is way down below that, maybe, right. you know, whatever that scale of the robot, but it's a long way down. So, yeah, if you put the motor up where the steering mechanism and then run a belt down, right? yeah, certainly you belt could the same that. idea as a chain. Yeah. yeah. How, and how about the only a way I can see... Really well, big wheels. Well, there is that, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. maybe the whole robot inside the wheels. That's what <laughs> 
That's what the great thing about this movie is that you can climb over things like Jaybot does. Sure. And make it. There's a company in Dallas that uh, that makes what they say is the future of robot wheels that are basically, uh, you know, uh, the coreless motor, and it's a little flat thing with a with a, a planetary gear built into it. And uh, so basically, they are flat and small enough to go inside the the wheel. Who's hmm. that? And uh, I've forgotten the name of the company. It's here in Dallas. I've got it bookmarked somewhere. If I can find it, I'll uh, I'll post it to the to the okay. net. But they're convinced that they're the future of robotics, and uh, and who am I to argue? Uh, <laughs> well, they look pretty too. Cool. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, Doug? Yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I I don't know their name right off. How much does one of those cost, though? They were in the range of you could, if you were really dedicated, you could buy one. You know what I mean? <laughs> but but. You know, you'd, it, it definitely you would wouldn't want to waste them. Yeah, you need wanna, six of them. Yeah, you know, there's something like you know they're like twelve hundred or if I I'm just guessing now because there were enough that I would say, yeah, you could buy those, but well, you know. if, if, yeah, I've started budgeting this robot and I'm planning to use the Pololu twenty five mil motors with the built in encoders and those are like. Yeah. 40 bucks a pop and then i've got to get three three like stereo i don't know what you call it three dual motor controllers i've got to get batteries and you know everything six times i've got to get the steering assemblies and the servos for them and you multiply everything by six with the controllers and all that and it's easily a two or three thousand dollar robot well i can save your thing, little money one of the you don't things have to have steering in the center legs just the inside yeah. One of the things I should point out, you know, there there is a on the webs on the DPRG YouTube channel, down on their home page, there's some tutorials down at the bottom. And there's one by Greg Nadell uh, about uh, basically the uh, basically about the mechanics of building a robot, mm -hmm. particularly the wheels and motors. And, you know, he'll tell you right off, if you have a motor and you stick a wheel on the end of it, on the shaft, that is really, really pretty piss poor. Mm -hmm. Because the, the gearbox Definitely. that's on the end of your motor doesn't have the right bearings for this to just be hanging out there. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why on that new design that I was doing, I went and put an external pillar block out here. Yeah. To try to overcome some of that. But the right way to do it is, uh, again, if you look at the VEX robots on their VEX, VEX robotics site, you'll always see that they have, they have their motor hooking up to a gear, and the gears power up the different, wheel, the different wheels. There's never so that the motor is supported on both sides of the mm -hmm. Of the of the starting gear, sure. And, and I know I totally agree with you, Doug. I mean, you've kind of mentioned this before, and it, it comes down yeah. to the fact that if I'm talking about a motor that's that big, and I'm going to have six of these, the weight of the entire robot, which is going to be pretty heavy by the time I add everything in, is resting on six little tiny bearings, and that just isn't going to happen. So I agree that if you can't keep the scale of the robot down small. Yeah. You're asking a lot of those bearings. Yeah, so that idea, that idea that Doug had of trying to do gears or whatever, and I I had said belts, my solution was possibly belt drive. And that way you oh, shoot. I agree. That's, that's the way yeah. There's a cat, on, a cat on YouTube named Bruton, and he does a bunch of stuff. And what he does, he, he almost 3D prints all of his stuff. He prints TPU, all the crazy stuff. And what he does, he uses brushless motors, so he has mm -hmm. a lot of speed on them, right? But um, how he gets the low speed and all that kind of stuff out of it is with belts, and he uses the belt uh, uh, belt gearing between you know his motor if his, if his wheels this big around, you know his gear may be that, and you have a little bitty tooth wheel at the top, so that's where he that's how he gets his gearing and how he gets his torque out of that motor. Yeah. Well, I don't really have, I mean, Harold, that won't really be a problem because the Pololu motors come in a, like, a, like a dozen different gear ratios. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so even if I'm running one-to-one -one off the end of the motor, 
it's it really it's Doug Parody's point is that it's to shield the the motor from the weight of the robot, and that's I think again with a belt is probably the easiest. And in fact, one of the thoughts I had was that rather than trying to find a really really deep wheel, like maybe a 60 centimeter or 60 millimeter deep wheel is to actually have the belt in the center of two wheels. And that way it's just the belt coming down between the Come two here. wheels. And that way I can create an axle around that. Yeah, right, right, right. It's tricky. Yeah, but the thing there would be, Murray, would be to have a yoke that mm -hmm. reached around both wheels so that yeah. the outside ends of the wheels were, were supported. Because mm -hmm. if, if you look at some, a lot of my own, in fact, my early robots, if they, as they were worn year after year after year, they start doing this number. Uh, yeah, they're sagging. Right? They start getting saggy. And the reason for that is because that bearing in there is just getting sloppier and sloppier. Mm -hmm. And uh, bearing, yeah. Yeah. Just so, for the case. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you look at David's J-Bot, for example, there's no direct drive anywhere in his robot. Mm. Okay. And he does it with belts too, by the way. And, and and when you do belts, the one thing you've got to got to figure out is how to be how to retain tension on them, mm. either with an auto tensioner or a tensioning mechanism. Yeah, because they do stretch. They do stretch. Well, and for the robots I've been building so far, they've been running on floor and on my deck, which is pretty smooth. And so I think the scale of the robot and the motors and all that's is fine. But if I'm gonna go build a rocket, if you, motor, do, K, if you do this on your wheel, if you pick up what is it, K10? If you pick them up and do the K, how much wiggle you got this way? Um, maybe a mil. A mil, a mil, a mil a meter. Maybe. Yeah. Well, they don't wiggle. They don't wiggle much. I mean, I, I guess my point is, is I don't disagree with you that I'm just saying that on a smooth surface, is indoor robots probably not a problem. Yeah, but yeah, the whole yeah. point of doing a rock or bogey is to be able to take it outdoors and bang it around the way David does with his J bot. You know, he's banging into rocks and everything, and and you couldn't possibly have a motor survive that. I I, I agree. You know, uh, if you look at the, right? one way that uh, I'm not. Uh, advocating this design but if you look at the thumper they put they essentially if you look in the web if you search around for the guy who created the thumper and his original because his original one was made out of pvc pipe hmm. and before they yeah, made a kid out, before they made out a kid and you know oh, yeah and you can get that at polo yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah now but the original design is still you, you can find the web page or at least you could. And, uh, you know, he explains how he did it all. And he encased all his in PVC pipe to protect mm -hmm. the motor. Okay. Now, obviously, cooling is probably, you know, I don't know how it's heat performance. And like I say, he does nothing to protect the, the outboard bearing of the motor. I mean, it's just, just hanging out there. But mm -hmm. anyway, it's still something that you might want to take a look at for some ideas. Mm, well, thanks. Yeah. And and probably the I don't know the higher end polluter motors. They're probably going to have a bearing on the on the outside, and a bushing at least a bushing on the inside. So yeah, yeah. Um, well, they might be a sleeve. You know, you know the Pittman motors that uh, used to be available surplus. Yeah. There were two types. So the outside bearing would would be a sleeve bearing, and that's bad. I mean, it's okay. For, for us, we probably never wear it out for completely, but it's not a good design. And then there were a higher grade motor that had a ball bearing in it ball at the output. Yeah. And the thing is, is since, you know, they tried to do these things to keep them in the, the least amount of parts, is if you had one with a sleeve bearing, you could push it out and put a ball bearing in there. Uh -huh. You know, you could retrofit if you wanted to, and that would give you more uh, more radial uh, strength than than the original bearing. So be like a then, needle bearing though, because that's bushings are usually pretty thin. Yeah, that's, uh, they might be a needle bearing. You yeah. have to look at it. That's that's you might be, uh, 
Bruton does too. When he goes prints all those things and puts that big ring around there, he supports the heck out of them with some serious load bearings around there. So, you know, you're mm -hmm. concerned, Murray, about having it all on that little bitty bearing. Uh, he alleviates that by doing that motor offset like that. Mm -hmm. Speak something like that. Motor, you know, you, 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 you know, you got to have it look a little banged up and stuff, you know. Usually your motors will come with specs for what is a axial road, a loading and a radial loading. And uh, for our purposes, it's the radial loading that we're interested in. And uh, <clears throat> uh, mm -hmm. those, those go way up. Did I, did I say that backwards? Those go way up when you have ball bearings on the output. If you just have uh, uh, bronze bushings or something on the output, then that's fairly low. Uh, but if you have ball bearings on the output, and some good motors do have ball bearings on that. Uh, so we're talking about a gearhead motor uh, where the motor itself has got an integral gearhead and the final output shaft of the gearhead is, uh, is in a ball bearing. And those typically can handle uh, quite uh, larger stresses. Uh, so, for example, the RCAT robot that I run around indoors um, probably weighs uh, maybe 10 pounds, and I believe that those uh, uh, the bearings on those two are set for that. So they're actually just shafted, mounted directly on the on the motors. But if you start getting heavier than that, uh, <clears throat> then you run into all those problems that uh, uh, that Doug was referring to, where eventually it it gets loopy. Uh, also. You know, it's the more expensive motors that have ball bearings on the on the final output of the gear shaft. Uh, most of them won't. However, uh, I can see from experience that you can go in there and pop that thing apart, press that bronze bearing out, and uh, press a ball bearing into its place. Yeah. Uh, that's so that's that, that's, that, that's well within the capabilities of most hobbyists. Well, I'd have, of course, what I'm looking at is you know, the Polo ones don't say whether what kind of bearings they've got i think they're i think they're bronze bearings i would imagine oh, yeah they, would, the they would tell you if they were ball bearings yeah i'm sure they would and the thing is is that those motors have the advantage of being you know geared the size i want i can get six or 12 volts they have encoders on the back everything's great about them but i'd have to be able to find a matching bearing that would fit even if i you know that that'd be tricky um, maybe I contact their engineers and say, do you guys know of any bearings that would fit in your motors? Because that would be something they might know of. But yeah. You might be surprised at the wide variety of bearings that are available, small bearings that are available due to the RC cars. I mm. mean, you know, you can go on Amazon and just about name any, give me a four by six, you know, four millimeters by with a six mil of door and this, this. You could just almost throw any number out. And you, mm -hmm. there'll be a bearing for it. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, I think probably your point though is is well, actually here here we go. Doing a belt drive makes the whole mechanism a lot more complicated and heavier. So if I could put a ball bearing into the motor, that would actually be a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. One advantage of the belt drive is that you can actually have two motors instead of six and then run the belts down to the six leg tires one motor on each side handling three tires which i think is what jbot does yeah yeah but that, but that won't that won't work for a rocker bogey though you're right yeah i think it will I no think no it will. won't you have to have six independent motors in a rocker that's the way bogey. the drives work yeah that's the way the drive yeah, got, yeah. you yeah. could in theory have the two center wheels be um unpowered but you have to have four separate motors just to do steering yeah, I I wasn't sure how the steering would work. I gave it some thought, especially with the, not the belts, but the other method where you had the gears, because when it gets down to the bottom wheel, it can rotate around that gear and basically it doesn't care which way it is. And with the rocker body rocking, it's rocking on that center motor. So that doesn't affect it. But but I think I think it's something that you'd have to work through well, You're part right. of the difference is like my current KR01 robot is a pair of motors on each motor controller. So it's a stereo pair kind of thing. But um, with the rocker bogey, part of the design is that the all six wheels are independent 
and have independent control so that if any one wheel gets stuck, the controller of the whole robot can basically dial in a little bit extra, a, a PID controller basically, right. on the motors so that each individual motor has its own PID controller so that it automatically reacts to its specific, you know, um, requirements. If it gets stuck or is spinning in sand, or it gets stuck, it automatically speeds up or slows down. Whereas if you've got two motors on the same PID controller, which is what I'm doing, that would never work. Right. I, I was thinking of a, a slimmed down version of the Rocker Bogey where they didn't have the steerable wheels and they did skid steering uh, and yeah. it was made out of PVC. Well, that's kind of what I've got with my current robot. Um, the one thing I should mention is that um, when Maximilian and, and what's the other guy's name, Carl? Nero. Nero, when those two guys do the presentation, they are going to present the ExoMai robot, which is not a rocker bogey. It's um, the alternative that's used on the ExoMars robot, which is a different design. Whereas the rocker bogey has a armature that goes across the robot and links up the left and right sides. They've gone, even not just on the ExoMai, but on the ExoMars robot, the one that's going to go to Mars, they've gone with what's called a, um, a remember Carl, rocker, a, a What's it called? I just forgot the name. It's um, triple triple bogey, I think it is. Yeah, it's a triple bogey. It's three bogeys. And so it's got two side bogeys and a back bogey that goes side to side, but there's no linkages between them. So it's a lot easier to build. And that's actually what I'm going to build. I mean, Maximilian convinced me that it was no huge difference, even for the Mars rover, that they had demonstrated the physicists and people working on these robots with, you know, millions or hundreds of millions of dollars at stake demonstrated that the triple bogey is just as good as the rocker bogey and the only reason to get this that nasa uses the rocker bogey is because of tradition is what he said okay so i'm i'm I, just a slight correction there um murray the uh it's not just an axle that runs through the middle in order to keep the two halves level it's a differential right there's a differential connecting the two sides together yeah. yeah, that's going to be bugs. Yeah, so as the two go like this, there's a piece that basically turns it sideways or something like that. I can't remember. The two halves are connected by a differential. Right, right. It's a, but it's just so an arm, body, right? So that the body itself maintains a constant position as the two sides rock back and forth. Right. But it's just a. But you could build that with just a couple ball socket things and an arm, right? I, I would uh, second what uh, Doug had said about uh, doing this with skid steering only if it makes our software as autonomous robot builders easier. Uh, if you actually have to go into a special configuration in order to rotate in place, that is, you have to rotate the front and rear wheels toward each other, which is what the standard barns road to rock the party, then that means that's a separate state. You have to go in separate states to rotate in place, whereas with good steering, rotating in place is simply steering no forward velocity. It's not a special state. And so it's easier to get in and out of. You don't have to recognize the special case. You just have to drive velocity to zero. Yeah, but David, the only problem I have is that um, with my KRO4 four-wheel robot, um, skid steering on a, on a wood floor with relatively sticky silicon wheels means that the robot shudders as it goes around a circle and doesn't work very well. So you only you can only skid steer if you can skid. You need new wheels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Slippery. Yeah. I well, you don't want sticky wheels for outside anyway. Yeah. I can report on a couple things. Um, I went out and bought the little tiny GPS unit from P uh, Pimeroni, and it actually works really, really well. You just take it and plug it into the socket like you do, and um, I can take it outdoors on my deck, let it find seven to nine satellites, which is amazing in New Zealand because I didn't know we had any satellites over us. I thought we were out in the middle of nowhere. And if I bring it indoors without unpowering it, it'll actually maintain connection with most of the satellites indoors. And I can actually have GPS indoors as long as it finds the satellites outdoors. So that's kind of cool. And these work really well. This, um, 
I was surprised at how good it is. Now, I don't really need GPS. It was mostly a, an explore, exploration. Now, the other side of things is um, on my differential robot, I am doing brain surgery. So this is the Raspberry Pi that I pulled off of it. And I've put on it a fire, a NanoPi Fire 3, which is back here. And I made a little bespoke um, uh, board on the top, and I've wired it up. But the thing to report, and that's what I'm, I'm going to eventually blog around about this, is that I bought an orange pie, and I bought a tomato pie. And I bought all these fruits and vegetables, but none of them are really compatible. That's the thing. They all claim compatibility. Now, to be fair to Nubaton, they don't claim this is a GPIO bus that's meant to match the Pi. It has a GPIO bus, but it's nowhere near the Pi's, and it doesn't claim to be. But the Orange Pi, which is an expensive board, and the Fire 3 board from NanoPi have GPIO buses that claim to be Raspberry Pi compatible, and they are not. Um, this one turns out that the um, I squared C pins that are supposed to be on three and five, the SDA and SCL pins, that's a different I squared C bus. They've swapped zero and one. And the one on the Pi is actually I squared C bus one. On this one, there is no bus one at all. And then on the fire three, bus one is on pins 19 and 23. Fine. I found them and I've connected to them and I have the ability to, uh, and that's why I've gone ahead and tried. On this robot, I've gone ahead and wired it up, and I've got it basically functional. But the, the downside of doing anything that's not a Raspberry Pi mm. is that now when I go to try to run my ROS operating system, my ROS, on it, I'm having all sorts of trouble because, of course, the Raspberry Pi OS and the Armbian OS, which is what I'm running on the Fire 3 because it can't run a Raspberry Pi OS, are just different enough that all the locations of files and all the things are just slightly different. So all the Python libraries won't work. So some of them stuff, some of the stuff does, but like for example, the PigPy library, which is how you connect to your Pi and how you get your motor control, my encoders and all that stuff, can't connect to it. It doesn't work at all. So I'd have to like do a port of that to figure out how to make it work. So long story mm. short, this has been a long exploration, a couple of weeks now, to find out that if you're actually doing anything that's very specifically Pi based, and you're using Pi hardware and Pi libraries, stick with a Pi. Because um, like the orange Pi, forget it. The Fire 3, almost. But I have yet to find one of these non-Raspberry Pi compatibles that can do what a Pi does. And it's been kind of painful. I've, I've spent hours trying to get this Fire 3 to go and got onto the Armbian mailing list and found out that they hate Raspberry Pis there. Um, even got in a bit of an argument with the guys who are the heads of the Armbian mailing list or whatever. And they, you would not believe the language that they use. They call everybody who uses a Raspberry Pi an idiot or clueless or, or noobs and just all, you know, I actually responded to it and sort of, and then I was just like, okay, forget it. You know, it's like those people who are way on the spectrum and you just get into their space a little bit too hard and they come back. And if you saw them in real life, they'd actually punch you. Like, uh, anyway. You so, mean whether you use a, a, a semicolon or end of line for a statement end? <laughs> in fact, yeah, the whole idea that you use space as a, as a space characters as a means of expressing, um, indentation or any, all that whole thing they get into those arguments and you can see those arguments that have been going on for decades every day they have guys arguing about this stuff and you can tell that they're banging their keyboards and just like oh this is one of those reasons why as you get older you just don't want to get near young programmers it's just ah uh. it's, it's a good thing you didn't tell me emacs is much better than vi oh lord <laughs> get out the holy water on that one yeah <laughs> As a, as a note on that one, it's funny. One of my very first tasks in my very first job in 1985 was to write a VI manual. We you had these little notebooks. Have... We had to give them out to students, and they needed a VI oh. manual to give out to the students. So I, my very first thing was writing a VI manual. For and you them. lived to tell the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still use VI every day. So. 
I can't tell you how many times I hit the escape key now to get out of modes. I just can't tell you. I mean, I'm I'm on Visual Studio, nowhere near something. Okay, I'm done with that. Escape key. What? I'm still doing that. I still do that. I even do it in bed. I'm escape, escape. Harold, I do it too, and I do colon WQ to get out of it. I get that, and then I got to go delete it out so I don't check that crap into my source code. <laughs> hey, what's this first? What are these colon WQs doing all over my source code? <laughs> exactly. yeah. Steve, but, but I grew up on Emacs, so I never learned VI, but Emacs apparently lost, so I'm just lost. Totally. I'll tell you what, I I have never sat down at a Linux machine that uh, that didn't have VI. Exactly. From, yeah, that's, from, that's from supercomputer to little tiny, you know, sticks. Everything has VI. Yeah, and not a one of them has Emacs, so what a what a bad bet that was. And they all speak the American standard for computer information interchange. Yeah, they all do ASCII. I, I, although the cool kids these days, um, they're using like things like Pico and Nano, and that are some kind of you know hybrid version of visual uh, editing and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, whatever, you know, knock yourself out. Don't really care. I mean, in fact, as far as that goes, if I if I know I'm in VI, uh, arrow keys are not a thing. I'm using the GHJK stuff to move around my to re move around my screen. Ipsa dick. Ipsa dick. Oh yeah, there you go. There you go. That's You're not I'm allowed doing. to say that in public, David. I know. <laughs> That's uh, got a got an HR chapter coming on that probably. Yeah. HR book chapter on that one. Very cool. Gentlemen, I, I have to go away. Me too. Right. Me too. It's getting late. Me too. Yeah. Right. Everybody have a great Bye. evening. Well, sounds Catch like a plan. Yeah. Have a great day. Be safe. Great week. All that good stuff. Signing off. Yeah. See you next right. week. Yeah. Thanks, guys.